Hello, everybody, and welcome to Learning to Play Fate, the GM edition. Uh, I hope that everyone is having a wonderful December, and I thank everybody who was excited about today and who is going to be here and is here. Um, it's going to be a good time, and I hope to provide a lot of answers for everybody so that um, everybody can get some value out of this. So um, just a couple of things before I begin. Um, first, I want to say that the contest uh, winner will be announced later today uh, on Twitter. Uh, I haven't gone back into raffle cop raffle raffle copter if I can say that word, uh, and uh, checked who uh, wins. I'm going to do that a little bit later today. They're going to win a print copy of the Fate Adversary Toolkit. Um, it has gone out of print, but IPR, uh, Independent or Indie, Indie Press Revolution, uh, still has about 30 copies. So if you want to get that in print, um, get your orders in. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to my daughter, Astrid. She's going to be watching today. Um, she has really dived off the YouTube uh, like cliff and has been watching a lot of YouTubers. So whenever I told her that I was live streaming today, she was super excited. And so she'll be here and I will not be surprised if we see her in the chat. In the chat. Um, so great. Uh, I am going to be paying a, a lot of attention to the chat today uh, because I want to make sure that uh, I'm seeing everybody's questions and trying to answer them in real time. Um, that way we don't miss anything. Uh, what I have, what you're seeing right here uh, is I, I asked a couple of weeks ago for questions. I, I went to Reddit and Discord and Twitter, um, you know, basically like all of the places on the internet. And I asked for questions and I said, hey, what, what problems do you encounter whenever you play Fate? Like, what are your questions about running Fate? Um, and I saw a lot of that and I got a lot of feedback. And so I copied and pasted all of the questions. I, I put them up on this virtual whiteboard here. Um, and so what I did was I kind of sorted it into groups, into clusters, uh, to make sure that, that the top various topics, um, we could kind of address as we went along. So, um, I'm going to, I, I have some notes off to the side on my left. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through my notes and go through this. I don't have it in like any particular order, uh, but I'm going to, to answer the questions after we're done dealing with all of the questions that you see on the board right here, um, answering, uh, as many of them as we, we can, um, we're going to go over here and this hidden planning board that we have right here. That's going to be the second part of what we're doing today. Uh, the second part of what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be planning the January learn to play fake game. What we're going to be doing is in November, we played a weird West fake game. OK, the the players um, came together. It was a great group of people. They had a great time. And uh, in Discord, they asked me, can we please have more sessions? And um, I thought about it and I thought like, well, you know, we could definitely do that and focus on some of the things that they wanted to focus on as players, which was social combat um, and various things that you don't typically get with fate. So we're going to be planning out what that looks like. And what that's going to do is that's going to give you an idea of how another fate GM plans. Now, my reminder would be that that this is just how I plan and everyone will be different, but uh, it'll be nice to kind of look under the hood and get an idea of how some, some other people do that. Oh, so let's go ahead, pardon my yawning. Um, I was up quite late last night. Um, so let's go ahead and start diving into some of these questions. Um, if anyone has any follow up um, or anything to add in the chat, please go right ahead. Uh, we're gonna start with um, comparing fate to other systems. OK, so these are the questions that kind of came together asking, you know, how does uh, how do you like what are the differences between Dungeons and Dragons and fate? Um, this question is in terms of DMing. Um, then we've got another one like how do you sell the idea of fiction first role playing games to people who are used to playing Dungeons and Dragons? Um, and then, uh, you know, how do you best translate one game system to another game system to fate. Um, so I'd like to kind of spend a moment on these questions. 
Uh, the first thing that I'd like to remind people is that um, Dungeons and Dragons and Fate are, are different types of role playing games. Um, and if you think in terms of games, um, you know, my thought is that it's just like board games have different types of games. You've got press your luck games, you have deck building games, um, and you know, you've got European board games, you've got Ameritrash, um, you've got all of these different types of games that get played. The same is true with role playing games. Okay, so Dungeons and Dragons has its own kind of focus, and Fate has its its own focus. So there's there's a world of difference because they they run differently and they have different strengths. So um, as far as like um, the the difference between them in terms of like running a game um, is that in Fate you you don't have to worry about um, uh, whether or not you're aligning the rules correctly or applying the rules correctly. Um, Whereas in Dungeons and Dragons, there are very specific rules for monsters. Um, and you can use some hand wavium to, uh, to kind of make things happen. But the more hand wavium you use, the less you're really using the system. Um, so let's talk a little bit about selling these, these fiction first games. Um, again, it comes back to this idea of like, board games and how there are different types of board games. Um, and that's an analogy that I think a lot of role players could use to help talk to their groups about, you know, what the different role playing games mean. It's kind of like, you know, if you play Settlers of Catan and you're only willing to play Settlers of Catan, um, you know, your friends might want you to branch out and play some other board games as well. Like, like it's okay that Settlers might be your favorite game, but you know maybe somebody wants you to to play something else like Wingspan, um, and so whenever you're talking to your players, kind of bring up this analogy of saying, you know, you don't play just one kind of board game. Why not play another kind of role playing game as well? Um, and so that might help them understand that they're kind of driving into a very specific niche. Um, for that oh, you know um one of the other kind of barriers that i've seen for people who play dungeons and dragons who go to a fiction first kind of role-playing game uh like fate is the idea of um creating things versus the idea of pulling things off of the shelf so um, in Dungeons and Dragons, you have a, a laundry list of things that you can be. If you want to uh, play an elf, you know exactly what that means because it's in the book. You can kind of pick and choose um, your heritage. You can pick and choose your classes. You pick and choose those class specializations. Um, everything is listed there for you. And so you're able to, within those constraints, um, build something that you, you want from that. Like um, you get to pick your feats, all of that. Uh, with fate, it's much more open and it, that can be difficult, uh, because, you know, no one knows exactly, at least whenever they first come to it, they don't know how to, to write something open like that, you know, to create an aspect that says, Hey, you know, I want to be this really cool thing. They need to, to be able to have that creative energy. And so um, when I try to sell new players on fate, um, I try to um, to help guide them and ask them very specific questions or provide them with pre-generated characters, uh, something that allows them to um, to make a couple of choices and get started very quickly so that they can can understand what's going on. Um, some players will will take to this uh, very easily, like a duck to water and other other players may not like that. Um, but the trick is, is to try and ease them in as much as possible. Like, you know, maybe uh, every group is different. And so it's a matter of finding out what you think will work with that group. So some things that you could do is you could have the players are like tossed into a parallel dimension and their characters are rewritten as fake characters and they you know do this like one to three session quest using the fake characters and the fate rules and then they go back to to dungeons and dragons rule set that gives them an experience that ties in with dungeons and dragons that will let them experience fate in a way that um, would probably be more acceptable than trying to run a whole campaign or something um it it really kind of varies from group to group 
So um, I've got more to say on that, but unless there are specific questions, um, uh, I don't want to like spend all of my time talking about trying to sell D and D players on fate. Um, the last question here is, you know, how to translate from one game system to another, or rather translate from one game system to fate. Um, the, the, the key here is not to think about the mechanics that exist within the game that you're playing. So if you're trying to convert a Genesis game to fate, or if you're trying to convert a vampire game to fate, um, I, you know, or Dungeons and Dragons or anything to fate, um, the trick is not to get hung up on like what the rules or the mechanical feel is, but instead what the narrative feel of it is. You know, what are the kind of like important character and plot and uh, opposition like touchstones what are they you know um if i'm uh you know in pathfinder i played a a dwarf witch who had an animated beard because it was part of like some basically crazy thing that i did in pathfinder um, if i translated that character to um to fate that was one of like the key things that i really liked about the character and so i'm going to kind of turn that into an aspect and may even add a stunt to reinforce that um more traditional like D, &D or pathfinder players may you know they have an arcane archer and they really want to like you know reinforce this idea of being a magical archer well lean into that um you're not going to get all of the nuance and choices and selections that you get from other gaming systems that's I mean, that's why you play those gaming systems. Um, but you want to kind of take the highlights and make sure that the highlights of what people enjoy about that carry over. Um, a lot of times when someone wants to convert a, a, an existing game to fate, um, it's because they want more narrative control. And um, the best thing to do is kind of just eject all of the rules stuff and bring over all of the narrative things. Um, fate is very doesn't have a whole lot of crunch and honestly uh my uh my preference for fate is to start with almost no crunch and then kind of if you want to build extras on top of it uh then you can do that um, if you want to have something um a little bit more mechanical to represent things like if you were porting vampire the masquerade over maybe you would want something to do with um like you know uh, drinking blood and, and needing that that hunger um you know maybe you would look somewhere to add a rule like that but um for the most part it can all be done within fate with just stunts and aspects so that's that's kind of my thoughts on comparing fate to other systems um I don't see any questions in the chat, uh, which is good. Um, but uh, so that means that I am going to go on and move on to the to the next topic. Uh, the next topic that I want to talk about is kind of follow suit with that, which is getting players on board. OK, so um, getting players <laughs> to play any game is tough. I mean, I've I've played plenty. Um, or I've 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 dealt with players and tried to convince players to play a bunch of games. Um, I'm pretty fortunate. I've got a I my, our, my gaming group is literally a bunch of folks who love to GM. So we're always um, in for a bunch of things. But um, I, I can I've also been involved in groups where it's we just play this game and it doesn't go anywhere. So let's talk a little bit about getting players on board. So um, we have the questions here, like how can GMs foster PC contribution to the narrative, you know, getting them involved in the storytelling of what's going on here. Um, you know, that is um, the first thing that comes to mind is the faint achievement sheets, um, which or faint achievement sheet. Um, it's actually on the uh, fate SRD in the download section. Um, what it is, is it is a list of things that new players to fate can do. Um, it's literally an option list. I don't know why the fate SRD isn't loading probably cause I'm streaming. I'll let that tab open for a little bit. Um, okay, great. Here we are. So let's go to the downloads and in the cheat sheet, there is a fate achievements, um, and in fate achievements, let me just go ahead and open this up. Uh, this is why I'm sharing my entire screen right now. Um, this cheat sheet right here 
uh, provides players with uh, basically a list of things that they can do. So, uh, you know, I found that if you want players to do something, uh, give them a list of things to do um, or add something to their character sheet to say, hey, you can do this, um, even if it's um, something that they could do with something else, um, do that. So here, like spend a fate point to declare a story detail. Gain a fate point by compelling your own aspect. You know, all of these different things here. Um, as far as like rewarding players for these fate achievements, um, you know, uh, season that to your table. If you want to give out a fate point for every two that someone does, or if you want to give them a fate point for every four or five or whatever the case might be, um, you know, make it work for your table. There's actually no like listed advice on this sheet saying, to reward um, but you can absolutely reward players for doing these sorts of things and you might even like turn it into a contest like the first player who fills out all of these they get um, a milestone early like there's a lot of different ways that you can do that to try and entice um, your players with a carrot to kind of come forward and um, add things so I, I recommend that as kind of a first step to getting them used to the idea of how the system works and how it manages to add like narrative elements. Um, the next thing that, that I recommend for like trying to get players to add narrative elements is to ask the players questions about the world, to have them fill in details. And depending on the players themselves, uh, those details can be like, hey, tell me about, you know, the king's entourage which is a very wide open question. And if you've got the right players for it, you can come up with all sorts of crazy things, but maybe you don't have the right care, right players for that. Maybe the players suddenly like, they're not used to thinking on their feet like that. That's why they're players and maybe not GMs. Um, and so what you can do is you can be like, okay, so the, the King's entourage, um, you know, they are uh, renowned for, um, you know, uh, what is the thing that they're most noted for among the court, you know, or what do, what does the general populace think of the King's entourage? Um, you know, how many people are in the King's entourage? Like you can break down the questions very simply, like how many people are in the King's entourage? Great. Um, you know, who are the people in the King's entourage? Are they important people? Are they commoners? Are they like, you know, and then guide them through this process where the players are helping you build the narrative and build the world. One example that I used in a campaign a couple of years ago, I had, um, when I had prepped, I had prepped knowing that um, a cousin of the king was going to be coming with an army from the mountains. Um, and I knew that like the, the army was going to be dragon kin and uh, the cousin was going to have a claim to the throne because the king was dying. Um, and I knew you know, that the, that this cousin was a dragon kin. Um, and so I had all of my mechanical questions answered about like how, you know, things could potentially go, but I specifically left a lot of those details open. Like for instance, I didn't name the cousin. I didn't, um, you know, uh, I didn't list what the cousin's province, like, you know, what it did and why it was important. I didn't list why the army was loyal to the cousin. Um, I didn't, you know, add like why the cousin wanted the, wanted the crown. And I left these things open specifically so that the players could answer these questions, um, uh, in game so that they could contribute. Um, and you know, I've gotten to the point with my players where this helps give them investment in the game. And it also increases the creativity at the table because it provides me with, uh, a curveball. Uh, because humans are the most random randomizer there is. And they provided a lot of very interesting things that, you know, that, that made that story more worthwhile and things that I hadn't thought of, but then I started to use as things went on. So um, it's, and by using that as time went on that the players had invented, um, it shows the players that whenever they invent something, that that something has a, a, a permanence. 
like there's an object permanence almost within the campaign where like, OK, so you said that this this cousin's um, territory was renowned for having a metal that had this special property. Um, I'm not remembering it off the top of my head, but uh, that fed into the campaign and that particular metal came up a couple of extra times uh, in the game. And so the players knew that what they had contributed had helped build the world and it was reinforced, making it. Uh, you know, more likely as players that they were going to want to contribute again because they saw what they had built in the world. Um, this is sort of the reason why I, I run Microscope, the role-playing game Microscope um, uh, by Lame Mage, I believe, Ben Robbins. Um, it allows everybody to create together and creates a, a great degree of buy-in. Um, and so that like getting them to add narrative ideas, that's um, start small and grow it as they're able to answer questions. Um, the last piece of advice for for that that I would have for you is some players may not be good at thinking on their feet. Uh, and that's OK. Like my personality type is such that I think on my feet all the time. Um, and that's usually how I best think. Um, but not everybody is like that. Some people like to go away and think and come back. And so make sure that whenever you're getting narrative ideas from them, um, that you also give them opportunities to create things whenever they have time to reflect and think about things. So you can say something along the lines of like, for the next session, we're going to have, we're going to be going to a new town. Um, and I'd like between now and the next session for everybody to come up with some things about the town. And then you can ask them like, what thing do you want to come up with for the town? And then they can go away between sessions and provide that information to you either between sessions or when the session starts, depending on, you know, your taste. So um, so those are some things to consider to bring players into the narrative. And, and hopefully that will uh, help. So looking at this next question, um, you know, how best to encourage players to adapt to the fate mindset? Um, that was really part of this first one that I did. A, question that I answered as well. Um, uh, so let's look down here. So how to try and get your players into character and not treat it so gamey. Um, you know, players tend to play their characters like a video game going for high stats, uh, making sure that they like, you know, their, their, their top skill, um, has a stunt that stacks on top of it, making it like peak skill plus two, um, and those sorts of things. I will tell you that there are players like this and um, it is it is tough to break them of those habits. And um, in addition to being tough to, of breaking them of those habits, um, you shouldn't penalize them for making mechanically sound choices. Um, like I. So with this question, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just uh, trying to think before I speak, which is something I rarely do. But uh, whenever a player builds a character, they're telling you what they want to do. So if a player decides that they've got a peak skill and they're going to pour a stunt on top of it to raise it to that, like they always get, you know, uh, you know, good like anytime they use a sword, they've got three stunts for all the three different things that they do in combat. And they're always like a powerhouse in combat. Well, the, the answer as a GM is give them lots of combat. That's what they're that's what they're saying that they want is that they want lots of combat. But there are other players at the table as well. OK, so that means that you need to balance out the encounters. Um, if if um, your players stunts are coming into play every session, like all the stunts, every session start varying up the um, time kinds of tasks that they need to do. Like, for instance, like give them an encounter that they have to talk their way through, um, give them uh, just different kinds of, of puzzles to solve. Um, I don't don't take away um, rewarding the character for, you know, that that, you know, leaning into the mechanical, but also don't be afraid to provide them with options where they're going to really suck at it. So um, as a as a player, um, I've played role playing games for like 22 years or something like that. Um, 
I've played a lot of optimized characters. And I personally know that whenever I play an optimized character, like I'm really good at one, two, and three, and I'm really bad at anything else in existence. And so I, as a player, know that I've got a vulnerability that the GM can and should use against me. So my character who is, you know, a barbarian who is really good at cleaving monsters in half, um, you know, my GMs would throw me into encounters where I would have to use diplomacy. And I, as a player, accepted that because that was also fun because I was really, really bad at that. Um, and so if your players are creating like mechanically super powered characters, remind them that they're not going to work out so well in other places and that things are going to be balanced or need like the encounters that they're going to have are going to be balanced. Um, like for instance, Oh, what was I just about to think of? It just went right out of my head. That's the worst. Ah, oh. well, hopefully it'll come back to me. So let's look at this last post-it note right here where it says how to keep things from grinding to a halt every time a player stops to decide if they want to succeed at a cost or accept a bad roll. Huh. This is um, this is a good question um, because sometimes uh, things do grind to a halt as you're trying to figure out like, okay, so what would the cost be? Like, well, I'm not sure. Um you know, maybe like, and you hem and haw on trying to figure out what that cost is. Um, one of the things that you can do is um, kind of just tell the, tell the player that like, if you want to succeed at a cost, um, you have to come up with a cost for it. Um, you as a GM or can also come up with a cost. It varies by like what the overcome role is. Like some things have very obvious downsides um, and other things uh, maybe don't. Um, so, so coming up with what that cost could be, it might be a bit of a time sink. Um, uh, that is, that's my biggest problem with, um, succeeding at a cost is coming up with what that cost can be sometimes. Um, what I will do as a GM is if I know that like there's a high likelihood that players are going to do certain things in the game, like I know that I'm going to have a locked door that they're going to have to bypass. I'm going to like, I might make a note saying like, oh, if they have to succeed at a cost, then I will, you know, I'll up the number of opponents who are on the other side of the door or I will, um, you know, uh, they break their lock picks or, you know, something along those lines. Uh, so, so that's kind of, uh, that's a trick that I use sometimes to help with, uh, those successes at a cost. Um, you know, so that would be like having some pre-written, some, some, uh, some cost, uh, some costs and asking the player to come up with a cost. Now, if your player uh, is presented with a cost um, or wants to accept a bad role and is hemming and hawing about the decision, then, you know, I personally, I will give them a time limit. Like I don't actually set a timer or anything. I'll just say, Hey person, you're kind of undecided. We want to keep the game moving. We're just going to go ahead with your accepting the, the bad role. Um, and then kind of moving on, like trying to encourage players to keep things moving, keep the game moving because everybody is playing at the table and you don't want to have it come to a complete stall when one person is trying to make a decision. So that's, um, that's another thing to consider is to kind of say, Hey, you know, you're taking too long. Let's move on. Um, the flip side of that is, um, respecting players who have slower decision-making processes. Like some players just um, have a difficult time with that. And so you kind of have to balance um, individual players versus like how long you give them. Like I can come up with a decision really fast. I always accept the costs whenever something fails because usually it means it's something bad and I drive my characters like they're stolen cars. So, um, but not everybody feels that way. So, uh, I hope that helps. So that is the getting players on board section to kind of attend to those sorts of questions. Uh, let's see the next section that I want to talk about to do is game building. Where is game building? Here we are. So let's, let's talk a little bit about game building. This is a very 
deep topic in and of itself. Um, and so I, but, uh, I mean, honestly, it could be its own learn to play fate session. Um, I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to not talk about magic systems first. Uh, I'm going to talk about good approach to different genres. Uh, I'll be honest with you. The best way to approach different genres and fate is to just, uh, use the core system. I mean, fate itself, um, rewards narrative, uh, Aspects and stunts can lean into genres and you can do every genre that you need to with core fate or fate accelerated or fate condensed and go from there. Like if you're doing a romantic comedy, uh, if you're doing a horror theme, if you're doing, um, you know, uh, the usual like fantasy or science fiction kind of things, uh, you can just use fate right out of the box, uh, using extras. One of the things that I think people, um, have an eye towards is whenever they, they see fate and they see that there are all of these different toolkits for fate. So there's like the sci-fi toolkit, there's the accessibility toolkit, which is great. You should read it. Um, uh, there's, uh, the, just the, uh, fate system toolkit. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, all, they see all of these different toolkits and they immediately kind of think like, okay, so we need to add stuff to make a genre feel like a genre. Okay. Uh, this, um, some, from time to time, I feel the same way because like when I, it, okay. So my biggest stretch of, of role-playing was with Dungeons and Dragons 3.5. I played it from, uh, whenever it first came out to whenever it, and like well past whenever, uh, fourth edition came out. And I used a lot of custom systems. Unearthed Arcana, the book Unearthed Arcana was my favorite book because it had a lot of alternative systems for changing the way that the game played and the game felt. Um, and because there were all of these different options for things like spell points and armors, damage reduction, I, uh, I picked and chose those to modify the game. Um, and that's how Dungeons and Dragons is put together. Fate, on the other hand, really just, um, you know, kind of goes through and um, you can play any genre that you want right out of the box. Now I'm looking over in chat and I see that my daughter Astrid is logged in as me. Uh, so if you see in chat, Randy Ost, which is my name, but my daughter's logged in as me, she says, hi, Papa. And hi, Astrid. I hope that you're having a good time and learning to play fate. Um, my daughter Astrid is seven. Uh, she is excellent at playing role-playing games and she, and in fact, um, we have been playing the quest role-playing game a lot lately. And I tell you what, she is turning into an excellent GM. Uh, she ran a game for me. It was just perfect. Absolutely perfect. Um, and my wife, Jess Ost is there in the chat as well. Hi, darling. Um, <laughs> She references fudge dice, so we're going to have a little aside. Um, whenever I ordered my very first set of fudge dice, uh, they came in the mail and I opened them up and, and I had been telling Jess like, oh, I'm getting fudge dice. I'm getting fudge dice. Um, and so I opened them up and she's like, she's like, those don't look like fudge. Um, and so like, they kind of looked like candy coated, like treats. And I had to, to disappoint Jess and tell her that they were in fact, not, um, they were not candy coated treats. They were just dice with pluses and minuses on them. Um, so it's now become a running gag in our house. So hello ladies. I'm glad that, glad that you're watching. So let's get back to talking about game building. So here we have a question about uh, how to use extras effectively um, and when to use extras. Um, like I said earlier, extras are something that um, as you gain system mastery, uh, you can start adding extras to, to your games uh, because you will have a baseline understanding of fate and then you can kind of start bringing in extras and experimenting with them. So one of my personal... Um, philosophies on house rules for games like this is any role-playing game that i play that has house rules um my uh my rule for that my rule for house rules is to actually um uh every rule has to have a stated reason why it's happening 
and its intended effect on the game. Okay. I mean, and this can be as simple as just, hey guys, we're going to roll a D10 for initiative instead of a D20 for initiative or something like that. Um, and the reason that we're doing it is X, Y, or Z. Um, and then I run it for a few sessions like that. And then I, you know, I ask the players, hey, is this working? Um, you know, is it doing what we want it to do? Is it better? Is it worse? Uh, is it the same, but just different? Um, and then we're able to kind of judge, you know, if that was a good addition to the game. I suggest that whenever you use extras and you add extras to your game, that you consider that, consider those, uh, like handling it that way. So for instance, I had a campaign, it was called the Royal Pride of Musketeers, and I wanted special rules for firearms. Well, I came up with my very own extra for firearms. I posted it for everybody to see. Everybody took a look at it. We agreed that, you know, like, yeah, we'll give this a go. It should be fine. Um, and we we played using it. And after, I don't know, four or five sessions, we kind of looked back and we're like, this is not working. And so we revised it. And after the second revision, um, we all basically said, like, there's... It's not adding anything to the game. It's not making it better. It's, uh, you know, if anything, it's just one more thing to pay attention to. And so we ended up scrapping it. So um, I suggest that you uh, consider extras the same. Add extras, but also see how they affect gameplay. If they are making it better, keep it great. If they're not, then kind of take it away um, or revise it. So the last question that's here in game building is the big dark hole of a missing magic system. So fate does not have a magic system out of the box. The reason for this is that fate itself uh, models fiction. Okay. So what that means is that um, your fiction for magic is going to vary dramatically. Okay. So, um, what that means is, for instance, um, that when I talk about magic systems, if I'm talking about Cthulhu, it's different than whenever I'm talking about like uh, Dungeons and Dragons magic. And it's different than when I talk about Dresden Files magic. And it's different whenever I talk about Mistborn magic. Um, all of these different magic systems have different rules and patterns and um, ways that they play out. And because they have different ways in which they play out, you cannot have a default magic system. So when it comes to wanting to do magic within fate, um, we have to think in terms of uh, the narrative and potentially extras. Um, magic systems are really where a lot of fate games want to add extras because they want magic to be something special and or they're concerned about magic being too powerful or something along those lines. Um, I can tell you that I've run a Fate Accelerated game where uh, magic users and non-magic users um, were basically mechanically the same. I had no special mechanical rules for um, magic users versus not magic users. If uh, a wizard wanted to forcefully cast a bolt of lightning, uh, they did, and it was great. Um, and if... Uh, yeah, so magic systems really kind of vary. Um, hi Astrid. I'm glad you're in our bedroom. I hope you're nice and comfortable. Um, so, uh, yeah, so magic really varies by what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and this is, this is a deep dive with magic systems. My, my recommendation is to consider what kind of magic system you'd like to run and to look at all of the different fake products that are out there right now and find one that's close to what you're thinking about. Like the uh, Fate of Cthulhu is great if you want magic that kind of corrupts people. Um, if you'd rather have something, pardon me, um, if you'd rather have something uh, more ad hoc like Dresden Files, use Dresden Files. If you want something that feels a lot like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, go to Fate uh, Freeport. 
uh, and the uh, the worlds of adventure, which are pay what you want uh, on drive through RPG and uh, itch on the evil hats uh, store. Uh, they've got a lot of different ways to handle magic and various things of that nature. Secret of Cats has a really great magic system. I think it's um, it's pretty simple. It only does a couple of things, but I think it's pretty great at what it does. Uh, so uh, also Venture City. Venture City powers are amazing to use for magic or special abilities. Um, I have ripped off Venture Cities or Venture City so many times for so many different things other than superheroes. It's amazing. So that's kind of what I have to say um, very quickly on a missing magic system. Um, so uh, that is that. Oh, all right. Let's see. What do we got next? Uh, next on my list is fate points. So let's talk about fate points. Let's go ahead down here and zoom in so everybody can see that. All right. I hope everyone is enjoying themselves and getting some value out of this. Uh, right now, we're about uh, halfway through the various topics and questions that were there. Um and after that, we're going to take a short break so I can get a little bit of water. And then I'm going to do uh, session prep for January for the uh, Wild West second session or Weird West. All right. So when it comes to fate points, the first question here is it seems way easier to spend fate points. So, you know, how do you keep the economy flowing in a fun way with fate points? So um, the way to keep fate points flowing is, um, well, let me rewind that a little bit. The very first thing that um, is on my mind whenever it comes to fate points is that I want the players to skid into the end of the session with almost no fate points. Um, so uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, that means that I've challenged them enough that they've spent most of their fate points. So they feel as though they've done something. Um, and the other reason for that is that they refresh their fate points at the beginning of the next session. Um, and so what that does is that allows them to feel as though like, okay, so now we're kind of powered back up again and we're ready to take on more challenges. So that creates a nice flow there between those two things. As far as keeping the flow going at the table, um, that's a case of, of, uh, making sure that your challenges are enough to cause the players to, to need to spend fate points to succeed. So one of the things that a lot of um, a lot of fate GMs do is they set the difficulties too low. Um, and the other thing that they do is that they do not spend their fate points in a scene to make things more difficult. So it's a combination of those two things that you can... Uh, that can help with the fate economy to draw out fate points from your players. So, you know, if you have uh, players in a scene and they're trying to accomplish something and they make a roll and it's like, oh, I succeeded by one. This is great. You as a GM can be like, oh, but I've got a fate point right here. And it turns out that um, because of reason, it's much more difficult uh, than what you thought. And so then you start into a potential like anti up kind of situation where like the players like, oh, but I really want to succeed. Um, and then you go like, yeah, but it's more difficult um, and just spending fate points to kind of draw fate points out of players. Um, one of the things that um, I try to like get try to spread around the fate points in a scene to like my fate points as a GM to try and draw out, um, you know, players, get them to spend fate points. I try to avoid having like a giant scene where like everything is really difficult unless for some reason I want it to be really difficult. Um, so, uh, so that's, uh, those are a couple of ways to get fate points out of your players, um, raise the difficulty and spend your fate points. Um, the other part of the fate point economy is getting players to, to, to accept compels, like, you know, to, to get them to, uh, accept, uh, difficulty, um, through those compels. And this goes back to trying to sell the players on the idea that like challenges in fate aren't always going to be challenges against like monsters and traps. It's sometimes challenges against 
who you are as a character, like who your character is and what choices that they've made um, or the situations that they put themselves in, you know, like, you know, of course, because it's dark, you're going to, to, you know, twist your ankle, you know, and, you know, that's, that's a big complication or a compel rather. And, um, uh, getting players to accept compels is it's, it's a thing. Um, and we're going to talk about compels. That's, <laughs> that is the very next section that we're going to talk about. So we'll dive more into getting players to, uh, accept compels in a moment, but that's the other thing is to make sure that the players know that they can self compel and to make sure that they can, they accept compels whenever you present them to it, uh, present them, uh, so I see Astrid is in the office with me. Awesome. I love her. She's, she's a great kid. Um, all right. So, um, next one, a lot of folks seem to get thrown, uh, about the dynamics of the fate point economy, particularly about stuff they think isn't immediately clear from the rules. So like managing that fate point economy uh, is something that I think we need to talk about. Uh, this is a good question. I actually think Evil Hat posted this question uh, in Patreon. Um, so trying to manage the fate point economy, one of the things that, that I do as I am going through the game is I need to always know how many fate points my players have. Okay, so what that means is that um, I need to know that, you know, Tom has two and Fred's got three and Rob's got one so that um, so that I can have an idea of kind of who might need a compel. You know, if like somebody has spent a lot of fate points, I want to know so that I can start compelling them. Or if they're out of fate points, I can compel them and they can't buy it off. So that means that I basically as GM have like a free pass to make their life really tough. Um, and balancing that is something somewhat of a little bit, you know, uh, I don't know. It's a little bit art and a little bit science. Um, I try to make sure that, um, you know, players have at least one fate point as they're going into new scenes so that they can continue to like contribute to the scene positively. Um, I will also from time to time remind players that it is part of their responsibility to self compel from time to time to get fate points. Um, because there's a lot of things that I, as the GM are trying to keep track of and trying to make sure gets done well. Um, and so I appreciate it whenever a player says, Hey, I have an idea for a self compel. It, it makes my day. Uh, and so I will listen to what the player has to say and, um, I'll say, yeah, that sounds great. Or we'll talk through and modify it until we're both in agreement that it's good and they can get an extra fate point. Um, if your players aren't really good about, um, self compelling, then, you know, one thing that I like to do is just leave the player and never compel the player until they start compelling themselves. So they run out of fate points and then, you know, they might be like, hey, I need, you know, I need some fate points. Remind them that they can self compel and, um, you know, tell them that, you know, like you're waiting for them to self compel. So you can kind of balance um, the 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 fate point economy. Oh. One thing, one other thing is you might have a kind of player who likes to compel a lot and stack up fate points. Um, I have, I've got a player like that who will like start with three and then self compel um, until like they have five or six fate points. That's cool. You can do that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna offer compels. Um, and as long as they're making their life difficult, Sorry, excuse me. If they're making their lives difficult, um, I will continue to like let them self compel. But I try not to let them get too many fate points because they do roll over from session to session. Um, and it also means that that player is not spending fate points. And so um, I might start like the challenges that that player is going to solve. I might start raising the difficulty a little bit to encourage them to spend a little bit more. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of tricky and you can also offer them compels that are really, uh, when a player is, is kind of hoarding fate points is you can offer them nastier compels that make them absolutely want to say no. Um, 
And that way they spend their fate point to say, no, I don't want that compel. Um, that is another way to do that. Um, no, Astrid, you cannot say hi. I'm in the middle of this. So thank you for asking though. So uh, she is super excited. My daughter, Astrid, she really wants to, to be a YouTube streamer. Uh, I'm going to be setting her up with our own website um, over the holidays uh, so that we can have that set up so that it will be safe. She's not actually going to go on YouTube. Um, so, but I am excited to, to do that for her because she records some crazy videos. Um, all right. So oh, let's talk about compels. All right, so compels, uh, this is one of the tough things for, for fake players is, you know, how do you make a player's life more difficult um, without kind of, without like feeling like you're being a jerk or making sure that it's got enough teeth to be worthwhile. Um, writing compels is really difficult. So the, um, the first question here is examples of compels. Um, and that's something that, uh, that I, I'm not prepared with a bunch of examples of compels. Um, but one of the things that, um, we're going to do as part of the, uh, prep for, uh, January's learn to play fake game is I'm going to prepare, um, uh, some compels in advance for players. And I'm going to talk about um, why I do that as well. Um, uh, so compels, remembering to do them, doing them creatively and encouraging self compels. So um, remembering to do compels is something that uh, can be can be difficult if you're in the heat of things and everything is going well um, and the players are just spending lots of fate points. Um, you may forget to compel them every once in a while. Um, and that is okay. So, um, you know, uh, there are various things that you can do to try and remind yourself to do compels. Okay. So for instance, um, uh, lots of different tricks. So you could set a timer, and um, every time that timer goes off, uh, it provides you like a prompt to say, oh, I should compel. Um, so like, for instance, whenever I run a lot of games um, uh, digitally, uh, you can kind of see in the middle right here, I've got a little timer. Um, I can set this for like seven minutes and then in seven minutes, it will go off. Only I will hear it. So it's not going to annoy anyone that I'm playing with. And that provides me with a, a reminder that, oh, I should, I should do a compel because I haven't in the last seven minutes or 15 or 20 or whatever interval you want. Now, another thing that you can do to remember doing compels is create a note card um, that says um, compel on it. Um, and then on the, or, or compel done. And then the other side, it could say, you know, um, don't forget to compel. And so what you can do is whenever you, um, uh, compel, flip it over to the, like, did it compel? And then whenever the scene is done, you can flip the card over as you're going through your notes or doing your thing uh, in your little GM binders, and you reset it to, say, do a compel. And then what you can do is that will kind of train you that when you do a scene transition, that you're starting to think of, oh, I need to do some compels. Um, I know myself, uh, the place that I usually do compels is in scene transitions because usually whenever I'm like doing, um, uh, whenever I'm running a scene, I'm usually really focused on the scene and I have a hard time with compels unless the compel is obvious within the scene. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to try and figure out a way to, to hack yourself to, um, to, to remember to do compels. Now I want to, um, oh, I see Grayson Arts is asking about the, the timer. Uh, the timer that I have, um, it is, let's see. Um, let me grab the, uh, oh no, it's opening Chrome. I don't want to open Chrome. 
or maybe I'm just gonna go ahead and open Chrome since it's doing it anyway. Um, here is the link. It is a GitHub app or an app from a developer that I do not know. It's called Timer App. It's a simple timer for Mac. Um, it is literally like super small and super great. Um, and uh, it is very easy to use. Um, it's very handy for, um, for running online games. So, um, so yeah, so go ahead and enjoy that. There are also other things that you, other ways to do that. Like there is a, um, uh, clear left has a workshop countdown clock, um, that again, if you're playing online, only you will hear this. Um, and if you've got a, um, if you have an in-person gaming group, you could, you know, have the timer go off, um, in it. Depends on what you need. Um, I have all these different timers because I do a lot of um, user experience things and I like to kind of like keep on task um, and like time block things. Um, so oh, let's see. Um, compels and concessions. Examples of how they work and come up and play. Um, so compels... Um, Again, uh, having them come up and play, it, it's something that's a little bit more organic, but we are going to go through um, and talk about um, how you can kind of pre-write some compels for, for characters. Um, one of the things that I do is I look at players aspects and before every session, I will write down at least one compel for a player. Um, the compel will not be like a situational compel, like one that like ties into whatever's going on in the game, but it will tie into one of their aspects so that I have something in my pocket that I'm like, oh, they need a compel. Well, thugs from, you know, the Academy of Martial Arts are going to attack you because um, you are wanted by them. Excuse me. Something, something along those lines. Oh, so sorry. Um, so let's see, uh, how to use fate points in a more compelling way, similar to what evil, uh, how to encourage your players to use it and declare a story detail. Okay. Um, we can talk a little bit about, um, story details, which is something that, um, I kind of missed in the fate point section. This probably belongs down in with fate points, but let's talk about that. Now let's talk about, um, one of the things that you can do with a fate point is you can, uh, declare a story detail. So what that means is that as a player, you can say, Hey, guess what? Um, you know, it turns out that there's a secret door here. That's the, that's the best example for it. But you can also do a variety of other things like, you know, saying, um, you know, certain laws in the kingdom are true, or you have connections with such and such guild, or like you can really like build out the narrative. So, um, this is one of those places where like the difference between dungeons and dragons and fate, um, is like, there's a big gulf. So for instance, um, you know, I know I played, uh, the tail end of curse of Ravenloft with a group of friends. Uh, and at the end castle Ravenloft, like getting into this castle, you know, we had to figure out, you know, how we wanted to get in. Well, do we go in through the front door? Do we find a secret door? Like, where is the secret door? And the GM, the person running the game knew exactly where the secret door was and what we had to do in order to find it. Um, and like, those were the only options for getting in is we could go in through the front door or the secret door if we did the right thing to find it. Okay. Um, whereas with fate, uh, you can have like, okay, we've got castle Ravenloft. You need to get in. Like, how are you going to get in? It's like, okay, well, I want to like, it turns out that there's this giant cliff face next to the castle. And I want to scale down the cliff face using mountain climbing gear and kind of rappel into one of the top towers. I spend a fate point to do that. That is something that fate excels at because suddenly like there's this really interesting feature that's been added to the game. Like, you know, that allows the players to get in. It costs them something because spending a fate point to do that is, you know, a, a fate point is pretty spendy. That makes it that makes it interesting to to add a story detail to the world, you know. Um, and so the more players get into being able to add story details, um, the more interesting things can be. And yes, 
play, some players are going to try to abuse that. They're going to try and say like, oh, well, there's a secret entrance into the castle that it turns out, you know, my uncle has the key for. Eh, that's one of those things where like sometimes as a GM, you have to be like, listen, you know, that's. I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, or like you can have the secret passage, but your uncle having the key and then giving it to you just doesn't like, it seems like you're really trying to bypass things or you can be a really evil GM. Um, and you can say, yes, your uncle does have a key to that secret, secret door and secret passage. And that secret door and secret passage um, leads directly into the um, like, um, oh, oh goodness, uh, uh, Ravenloft. I'm trying to remember the vampire's name. Strahd, that's it. Um, Strahd leads directly into Strahd's feeding room where um, this character's uncle would bring various people from the village as food for Strahd. And so like, and the room itself is kind of an oubliette where like you can go in, but you can't go back out because of the way that the door is constructed. And so you can take what the player has offered you, which seems like, oh, this is a super easy in. And then you as the GM can completely twist it um, because with that kind of like that particular feature, it's like, oh, suddenly his uncle maybe isn't the best person in the world. And that leads to more interesting things um there's uh you know in theater there's a, a thing called yes and um and i'm i'm a big fan of yes and sometimes you need a hard no to make sure that things stay the right way but um sometimes with yes and you can give the players what they need and then up the difficulty elsewhere so um so just remember, you as a GM, nothing is real until it hits the table and is agreed upon. So what that means is that if a player uses a declare a story detail to make bypassing a challenge super easy, you can always add more challenges. You can always make other things more difficult um, as they go through. So that's, um, you know, that's fine. You can do that sort of thing. Um in fact, I'm going to let you in on a little secret from last month's uh, Learn to Play Fate. So the November one where we did the Weird West, we started off with a contest where the uh, the players were racing on horseback, trying to get to just the right train car on the train. They were having a contest with the train. So the train's riding along, they're riding on horses. Um, if they had succeeded, they got, you know, they got to a good place. And if they failed, they got... You know, they, um, you know, they got into a really bad train car. Um, I will tell you, honestly, as a GM, uh, it didn't matter one way or another uh, if they succeeded or failed on that. The difference on that, because uh, we were still going to to handle the next like series of cars the same way. The difference, the difference would have been how it would have felt and how things would have been set up. So they succeeded. They did a great job on the contest and they got there uh, and it made them feel like heroes, which was great. I wanted to make sure that they felt like heroes. But if they had failed, then I would have like played up a lot of the like the difficulty of getting from train car to train car and the descriptions would have been much different and felt different. So remember that like fate is a game of, of narratives and sometimes the um, success and failure doesn't necessarily rely on the dice dice rolls. It can sometimes rely on like how you're presenting what they're doing. So, um, so yeah. So if any of my players from that game um, were, are watching um, yeah, you, you did a great job. Um, let's see. What do we got next? Uh, I've got my little list here. Oh, GM prep, GM prep and conflict are the last two on the board here. Then we're going to take a break. Well, I'm going to take a break, uh, get a little bit of water 
take a moment and then we're going to do some GM prep. Um, wow. We're an hour into this thing. Thank you everybody for, for being here and staying here. I hope you're getting some value out of this. Um, if you aren't, I'm sorry, ask some questions and I'll help you out. Um, if you are, that's great. That's awesome. Uh, I like, I like helping people like I love role-playing games and I love fate and I love, um, sharing my love. So, um, so this first note here says, I'd love to hear the GM's internal monologue during a game session. Um, that's something that, uh, I'm going to be next month in with January's game. I'm going to try and talk out loud a little bit more about my decision-making process as we're playing the game. That way, um, we're able to uh, kind of follow along and understand the logic. Um, so let's see, GM using prep. Examples of how prep can be used to improvise and riff off of player characters and their actions. Um, this is something that's going to tie into the prep that we do later, which is kind of like preparing compels in advance um, and uh, uh, how we can, uh, and how prep can be used in ways that can adapt to those improvisations. So like when I show you my prep, I'm gonna show you examples from a past campaign of mine. Um, and then we're going to do some live prep of the, the next campaign. That way you get a sense of what my process is like. Um, I say process, uh, I mean, it's technically it's a process. Um, so um, GM prep, uh, someone asked about a GM version of my fate achievements. Um, yes, Chelsea, the GM internal monologue, uh, sometimes is not just a lot of panic screaming, but sometimes it is too. Um, you know, it's not cool to, uh, scream into a pillow during a game, but sometimes you want to as a GM. Um, so someone asked about a GM version of my fate achievements handout. That's something that I've been kind of noodling on. And I think that that's a good idea. Um, I'm actually going to, uh, mark that with a little uh, emoji. Let's add a little star to it. Um, and I'll come back to, to that, um, maybe over the holidays and work on a GM version of the fate achievement sheet. Um, if anyone's out there listening and, and wants to work on that, Hey, I would love to take a look at it and provide feedback. Um, or I'm happy to write it. Um, GM prep mindset for prep. Like what are you prepping for? When do you have enough? Um, prepping with characters in mind. Um, uh, prepping GM prep is one of those questions that like everybody handles differently. Um, my my philosophy for prep um, for for fate is um, pardon me. Sorry, um, my philosophy for prepping for fate is what I will typically do is I will prep um, uh, a series of NPCs, a series of locations, and a series of factions. Um, uh, I have a tendency to use the faction model, or I'm sorry, fronts, not factions, fronts. Um, I use the fronts model from Dungeon World. Um, uh, Dungeon World has an SRD online. You can access it, no problem. Uh, it's one of the few SRDs that I haven't done. Um, and you can, can take a look at how they have it there. I don't use it exactly as is, but I use that kind of model. And because I have the NPCs thought out and fleshed out and locations thought out and fleshed out and the fronts thought out and fleshed out, then I can kind of sit back for a story arc and just let everything go. The players do what they're going to do. And I can adapt on the fly because I know that like these NPCs are part of this front with this goal. And they're going to try to achieve that goal. And I have ideas on how they're going to do it. But whenever the PCs, uh, the players give a curveball, I can adapt because, you know, those NPCs can be like, oh, they did that. So now I'm going to do this other thing instead. Um, so the way that my prep usually works is I'll prep really heavy and hard um, for, uh, for each story arc of like anywhere from two to like six sessions, um, ride that out, um, and then start doing prep again for the kind of the next arc. Um, I get uh, a lot of a uh, lot of mileage and value out of, out of my prep. Uh, all right. So here we've got prep on hand items. Uh, it would be nice to see a behind the scenes of how prep works. That's what we're going to do today. Um, what stuff do you have already written? 
And for the second half of the question, what items or resources are good to have open to keep track of the important stuff like cheat sheet, list of possible consequences, other stuff? Um, uh, yes, that is um, very important to have open. Um, I'll show you a little preview of um, what we're going to talk about later. This is my uh, Royal Pride of Musketeers campaign um, and my prep for um, for sessions. What I will usually do, I think it's this one here, um, session 35. Um, what I do uh, is I write down previously so I have a bulleted list to remind me what happened last time. Um, then I have a series of list of NPCs. So I know that the stag lady wants to do this. I know that Guy Herno wants to do these things. I know Maud and Misilov and Holigardar um, want to do various things. Then um, over here, I have certain events that I want to see happen. Um, they may get stopped, but um, I'm going to uh, try and have those events happen. Then I have locations. So like I came up with the like uh, the pits of the night, the stag lady's throne room, underbelly prison, uh, the biblio temple. Um, and I have all of these locations as possible places for the PCs to do things. They're like, oh, well, we're going to like seek out, you know, Maud Dumont. Um, and I'm going to be like, all right, great. Uh, Maud Dumont is in the stag lady's throne room. And so I have an interesting location, an interesting NPC and put them together. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, and then, uh, down here I have, um, because I'm using notion for this, um, I have a, a database of all the, the different NPCs and I have them all categorized. We'll talk a lot more about this during the GM prep session, but basically I filter them by a, um, by filters that are all NPCs that would be in this area. Um, or are related to everything uh, that's going on, just in case um, my list of NPCs up here, which is short, um, in case they're like, oh, well, we totally want to go talk to um, Queen Constance. Uh, I forget how I pronounce that. Um, I can, can reference that very quickly. So let's go back here. So, um, so yes, definitely have like, Whatever process works for you to have information handy, have information handy. Um, so let's see. Uh, this is not particular to fate, but I see a to uh, but a topic I see in most learn to GM tutorials gloss over is how to help share the spotlight around the table, balancing against some players hogging all of the attention. Uh, this is um, definitely a an important topic to kind of talk about. Um, this. Being able to share the spotlight is something that makes, um, I think, games great. Uh, if you're playing like a one shot or a game that's only going to happen like two or three times, you know, or have two or three sessions, um, you're going to have to share the spotlight throughout the throughout the game itself. Like in like those um, sessions, you're going to have to each session, you're going to have to make sure each player has the spotlight. Um, years ago, I used to actually like write down everybody's name on a sheet of paper. And every time they had a, a good scene or a cool thing, um, something that I would count as a spotlight, I would actually put a check next to them. Excuse me. And I did this so that I would pay attention to sharing the spotlight. Um, and I, I've now like ingrained that a lot. And so I'm, I'm able to like, I know like, oh, well, so-and-so hasn't had a, a moment in the sun yet. Um, one other thing that I do with sharing the spotlight is I, um, with longer campaigns, what I like to do is have um, uh, basically kind of like, I, I like to have a, a meta plot going across like big arcs. I like to have a primary arc and then I like to have some running like secondary like stories going on like B B plot stuff. Um, and what I'll do is I try to um, an arc. Uh, I will try and focus on like something important to a character. So for instance, like if we come here back to my notes here, where it says, um, high horn pass, um, and 
uh, if we come back here, we can see that I've got this kind of chunked out into various places. So I have these five sessions that are related to the high horn pass. And these were related to, um, uh, to specific characters. Um, this Suffermer arc right here, where there were three sessions, that was related to a character who was from that part of the world. Um, and so what that does is that it, I can shine a spotlight on certain characters because we're kind of focusing on something that's important to them. At the same time, we're also giving the other players opportunities to do things and do things interesting or, or do interesting things. So um, it's a case of needing to, to balance that. Um, one other thing that I do to balance this out um, is I have a gaming charter. I'm going to load up my, uh, my personal wiki. Um, this is where I um, uh, keep all of my games. Uh, believe it or not, this gaming wiki has 14 years worth of uh, games in it. Um, okay, so we have, this was the charter that we have. Uh, I'm going to increase the size because I know that it's kind of hard to read. Let's see. All right, there we go. Um, I believe in having a gaming charter for every gaming group so that everybody has a shared expectation. Um I'm going to just go through this real quick. I've got expectations for the GM and expectations from the players. Um, one expectation that I have um, is share the spotlight. So play will be as a group, but some characters will be better at or more entangled in certain things. Um, so that's a, a reminder to all of my players that um, their job is also to share the spotlight. You know, don't try, like, if a scene is obviously like meant for certain characters, don't try to insert yourself to solve the problem or do something or steal the spotlight. Like, let, let things happen. Like, you may have a really awesome idea for your character, but that robs another character uh, from doing something. So um, I recommend gaming charters as another way to help share the spotlight, to have an agreed upon like play style and agreed upon thing. Um, and I find that they really kind of uh, squash a lot of problems in advance uh, by addressing those. Let's see, these questions were, were pretty long. So the text got really small. All right, so uh, I'd like to see more of your process on how you prepare for any given session. Um, yes, uh, we're going to see that um, today. Um, I do have uh, this this running fate videos that's mentioned here um, on this channel, on the Polyhedral Crew channel. Um, I ran a live stream game uh, that unfortunately it petered out and we didn't have an ending for it. Uh, we tried. Uh, to gather to do that, but it just didn't work out. Um, but alongside that, I did a did some running fate videos where I did my prep work uh, live on camera, sort of like what I'm going to be doing a little bit later on today. So um, those might be another good resource uh, for you to to watch and take a look at. Um, now here, uh, let's see, what do we do to, f uh, what to do to fill out scene transitions, like between major scenes? Um, Feel like there should be a smaller one there uh, so they don't just time skip to the next day or when they arrive or whatever. Um, my players have brought this up because it felt too stilted. What are some good options to put in there? Um, so this is this is um, an interesting question. And I, for transitions like this, I go back to um, the analogy of a role-playing game as a television show. Okay, so... Um, in television shows, sometimes it's very important to follow the character for every minute of what's going on, okay? 24 being the, like, take it to extremes. But, um, you know, other shows, you're following along with exactly what's happening as it's happening. There's a lot of, like, drama. But then there are other times whenever, like, time will just pass. And it's like, oh, it's just been a couple of days. Um, and so I would encourage you as a GM to talk to your players and say, you know, um, you're meeting with the, the person in a couple of days. Uh, we're going to hand wave those couple of days and move to the next interesting scene. 
Um, if the players want to play through every individual day, uh, talk to them about why they want to play every individual day. Is it so that they can try to stack up a bunch of um, create advantages so that they can try and make the scene go more in their favor? You know, talk to them about what makes the story interesting. Like, are they actually going to have fun playing a bunch of scenes, creating advantages before they go talk to somebody on, you know, in a couple of days? Or should they just go talk to somebody in a couple of days? Um, part of that is talking with your players and asking them, like, you know, what about this makes it stilted? Like, do you want to go day by day? Do you want to go moment by moment? Can we zoom in and out on the time scale of things? Um you know, talking to your players and getting that feedback is important. Um, in fact, one of the uh, one of the things that I find incredibly important as a GM is a um, an exercise that I do at the end of every game session that I run, and it's called like wishes and stars, roses and thorns. There's a lot of different names for it. Um, the what I will do is at the end of the session, I will say, you know, I will thank everyone for playing, and I will say, you know, I, now. I would like to know something you liked or didn't like or both about tonight's session. Um, and the reason that I ask that is I want to give the players an opportunity at the table to give me feedback to say, I really didn't like this. Like this felt awkward or to say, Hey, that combat was really awesome. Or, you know, I really like that, that uh, NPC, or I really like this scene. Um, or to give kudos to other players. Um, rarely have I seen uh, feedback to other players, but, um, but that's also a possibility. And so when you ask that, it's literally an opportunity for the players to tell you what they're enjoying and what they're not enjoying. And it helps you to be better at being a GM and it makes you better for that group. So, um, so if you're trying to figure out what's going on with scene transitions, um, you know, maybe just ask the group and say, Hey, listen, you know, at the end of the session, you can specifically say, so tonight I handle scene transitions differently than I usually do. I'd like to know something that you liked about it and something that you didn't like about it. Um, and then with that feedback, you can start to figure out, um, what you need to do. So, um, basically the, the bit, the best GM advice that you can ever, ever get is talk to your players. That is seriously just the best advice. Oh, all right. We have the very last uh, section to go through before we're going to take a short break and then uh, return for some prep. Excuse me. We're going to talk about conflicts. Okay. Um, and conflicts without actually having a conflict um, in front of me can be a little bit difficult to talk about, but let's see what we can do. So tips for creating an amazing scene on the fly. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a, that's a tall ask. Um, one of the things that I recommend that you as a GM try for is to create, um, a good scene. Don't try to make an amazing scene. Just try to make a good scene and always try to make good scenes. Some of them will turn out amazing, but always try to make a good scene. Um, one of the things that, that I've seen over my like 20 some years of GMing is every time I want to make a scene or an ending or something really, really awesome, I sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And um, there, there have been times whenever I tried to make something awesome and it backfired and turned out to be an overly complicated mess. And so the like the big ending scene that I had for a campaign um, turns into a, an exercise in frustration for everyone at the table because, you know, I tried and I got it wrong. Um, my recommendation is to um, try to always do good scenes and, and the amazing ones will come just naturally out of that. Um, the last part here where it says on the fly um, that comes from prep and experience. If you're really good at improv, great. Um, I am mediocre at improv. 
Uh, but I am good at improvisation when I have preparation. So whenever I prep the way that I do, I can create a good scene because I have various elements that I can put together in ways that um, like just snap together as jigsaw puzzles or jigsaw puzzle pieces instead of trying to craft something like, oh, I need an interesting NPC. I need an interesting situation and an interesting location. It's like, oh man, that's a tall order. But if I know that like, okay, I have this NPC in this location. Now I just have to figure out like what is happening in the scene that lowers my cognitive load while I'm playing and frees me up to, to create a better scene. Um, Let's go to this next one here. How not to make NPCs suck and actually do some damage to the players? Well, the really easy way to do that is to ratchet up their uh, their bonuses, their attacks. Make the NPCs actually have higher, um, you know, higher ranks. Uh, the Fate Adversary Toolkit, um, which uh, is, um, it's the, the core part of that is on the uh, Fate SRD. So the Fate Adversary Toolkit, like has types of adversaries and building adversaries. And it has a lot of great advice on how to make NPCs like, not suck, uh, and actually do damage. I can say that like, I got a, like, I was feeling the same way as, as the author of this question, um, before the fate adversary toolkit came out. And, um, uh, when it came out, it really helped me up my game and make things more dangerous. I mean, my games were, were good before, but then they got a little bit more, I don't want to say deadly because that's not really the case, but they definitely hit harder. Um, and it was, it was made more interesting because of that. So my recommendation for the answer to this is read through the fate adversary toolkit, either the PDF or on the fate SRD. I recommend the PDF because it has a lot of examples of, um, uh, genres and uh, like opponents in those genres. And, so you can really mine it for a lot of really good, um, good inspiration for opponents. Um, so it is, even though the rules for things are on the fate SRD, the, the PDF has such great examples that, um, you're really missing out. Um, so how to do a conflict, which is not either boring and takes ages or is utterly unchallenging to the players. So, uh, the first part, which is where it's boring and takes ages is that you as a GM, you don't have to have opponents. Like you don't have to have their stress bars maxed out. You don't have to like, if, uh, if a scene is turning into a drag, um, uh, have the opponents concede, you know, either like through officially conceding, um, and going through that kind of talk. Um, and negotiation with the players or just, you know, the next time you're, you're big, you're big, bad in the scene. That's getting really boring, gets hit. Turns out they're taken out. Um, the players don't know how much stress, uh, an NPC has. So you have control and stress and consequences are pacing mechanisms for the game. So if your NPC has like all three consequences and six slots for stress and the combat is getting boring, um, then you can, you can pace that with the, um, w by using stress and consequences by either making it shorter or adding more. Um, and if something is unchallenging to the players, you, you need to, to ratchet up the difficulty or start like inventing obstacles for them as the, the scene is going on. Now, um, one other way that you can uh, do a conflict, which is neither boring nor takes ages and is unchallenging, uh, is to create um, an interesting scene too. Um, the, you know, part of a conflict, like, uh, everybody thinks of the opposition whenever they, whenever there are conflicts, you know, thinking in terms of like, oh, are the enemies like really good and interesting? Do they have cool powers? Do they have like nice theme? Do I have enough mooks? Um, think about the area in which the combat takes as well. So, um, what you can do is think in terms of like geography, think in terms of architecture, think in terms of lighting, uh, think, think in terms of times of day, the season, um, and 
take the scene and make it really interesting. So, um, for instance, I was running my Royal Pride of Musketeers campaign and the player characters were trying to or were chasing down uh, a, a rival politician who was trying to escape the country who was with his bodyguard. And they ended up going like underground um, through a series of like tunnels and where the conflict happened. I was like, OK, they're going through tunnels. I'm like, all right, so I want to make this interesting. I'm like, okay, so there's a waterfall that's coming down that kind of like the the tunnel itself, there's a, a gap uh, and anyone who's going through this tunnel has to go behind the waterfall to get across or they can try and jump, but that jump is going to be really risky and, and potentially deadly. Um, and so um, what that did is that set up an interesting environment where this politician who is not normally going to be a threat like this politician was um, a very big threat in social and political circles. But, you know, whenever it comes to like, you know, an actual fight, uh, you know, a bit of a dandy. Um, but uh, it made the like some of the players decided to try and jump. Uh, some of the players worked their way along the slippery ledge behind the waterfall. Um, and during that time, the uh, the politician who was trying to get away um, was able to actually like shoot the player characters without being threatened. And so this led to a very interesting scene where like um, it wasn't just about like facing down this opponent. It was also overcoming the obstacles that were in the scene. So um, if you've got a, an opponent who is um, unchallenging, you can ratchet up like the scenery to make it more difficult. Um, so that's um, those are some things that you can do is like like change the scenery um, or like the environment around in the conflict. Um, let's see, uh, setting challenge levels low enough because you need to allow shifts of damage. I'm not entirely sure what this question means. Um, so I'm going to have to, to skip it. Um, but I will say that like, if you're trying to, um, yeah, you know what? I, I, I can't divine what this one means. If the person who wrote this is in chat and will clarify, then um, please go ahead and do so and I will answer it. All right, the next question, how to take out the party when you've learned to fear the TPK? Um, so whenever it comes to the like taking out of the party, there's a couple of different ways in which that can be defined. So um, I'm going to assume um, that you want to take out the party because you want to change the relationship with the party to the narrative, not that you want to kill all of the party members. If you want to kill all the party members, you are the GM. You can just wave your hand, rocks fall, everyone dies, no one's happy, and you don't have a gaming group. Uh, but if you want to take out the party, there are there's a variety of ways in which you can do it. Um, the first is that you can can actually create a conflict where like the opposition uh, has an edge. And when each of the player characters get taken out, they get thrown into a sack and taken out of the scene by horseback. And, you know, uh, that's, you know, part of what like losing that conflict is. If you want to have all of them captured. Um, so like if you're thinking like Return of the Jedi, where. Um, pardon me. If you're thinking like Return of the Jedi, where like C-3PO is worshipped as a god and uh, Han Solo and. Luke and Leia are all kind of captured. Um, you know, if you want a scene like that, then um, I as a GM will sometimes just kind of tell the party, like, listen, I kind of want you all to be captured because I think this would be a really interesting scene. And I will give you all a fate point for this. Um, I will literally just kind of tell them, like, listen, I will give you a fate point if you like if we go this direction, like it's not exactly a compel, but it's, I want to change the way that the scene is going. The Ewoks will actually capture you, which is not believable, but offer them, you know, a fate point, um, and you know, see how they react. Like one of the players may decide that they don't want the fate point and you can be like, okay, so everyone else will be captured except for you. And we'll play that out. Um, but again, talking with your players and finding out what's going on and making sure that, um, there's a high level of trust there, um, with your, your players, because if you say, Hey, I want you to be captured by these, 
by this opposition, your players have to trust that you're not trying to kind of screw them over or going to take their stuff um, and that they know that you're just giving them an opportunity for a different situation. So that's um, that's my thoughts on how to take out the party. Um, uh, how to effectively grok and leverage create advantage actions for PCs and NPCs. Oh, this is a good one. Um, so this is an area where I'm a little bit weak, which is um, strongly using create advantage with NPCs. Um, this is part of where a little bit of prep comes in for me, um, where whatever I know that like certain NPCs are really good in certain situations, uh, I will give them stunts to, uh, to, to power these sorts of create advantages that will help them out. Um, and it is, it is definitely something that can be a little bit tough. Like you're managing three or four different enemy groups that are attacking, you know, three or four PCs. Um, each PC is thinking independently for their character, but you as the GM are thinking of all of these different like monsters and creatures together. And, Sometimes it feels as though whenever you take a create advantage action, you're losing a chance to like hurt a PC or like try to like an attack a PC. Um, this is where um, going bigger in conflicts um, can help, like having more opponents than you think you should or having more um, uh, having stronger opponents, like more resilient opponents than you should. You know, maybe you have um, uh, so let me think. All right. So example time, going back to my Royal pride of Musketeers campaign. Um, one of the scenes that I had set up is that the, the player characters, the PCs were in this, um, remote, um, cabin in the woods. Um, and some assassins had come to kill one of the PCs. And the way that I had set things up is that I had, um, Oh, let's see. There were, um, spellcasters who were throwing bolts of fire at the, at the, uh, at the cabin from afar. There was another cluster of, um, opponents that were specifically creating advantages and uh, a couple of other power. And there was actually a single powerhouse who was just like a huge beefy bad guy, um, who was going to be charging in and, and doing most of the damage. And so these different groups were trying, were doing these different things. Like the, um, the wizards who were throwing fireballs were really trying to catch the cabin on fire. Uh, the group that was doing the create advantages, um, I'm not of mind of what it was. I think they were taking down magical defenses on the cabin. Um, and the, the giant like beefy bad guy was coming in to just, you know, hit hard. Uh, and I would say fast, but it wasn't very fast, but it hit hard. Um, so thinking in terms with your opponents of what they're going to do, like don't make them all just attack, um, have some that are going to actually like create advantages, um, uh, in combat, like specifically like that, that NPC or that opponent is creating advantages. And also remember that with the bronze rule, you can have the environment creating advantages for the bad guy as well. So, um, so for instance, um, and going back to the waterfall scene with the escaping politician that I talked about earlier, um, the, I could have made the waterfall a character in the game, uh, and on its turn, it would create, try to add free invokes to slippery and wet floor, which would be an aspect on the scene. And that would be, uh, an invoke that the, um, uh, that the, that I would use as GM you know, against, uh, the party. Now the party can also use that aspect, but they wouldn't get the free invokes. Um, so those are things that, that you can kind of do is, is turn environmental effects into create advantage machines as well. I wouldn't go crazy with it. It's one of those things that you kind of get, get a feel for, but it, it's, it, it really can make a scene more interesting without having a, a million mooks on the scene. How to handle aspect stacking, aspect stacking. Yes, this is, um, this is something that some fake GMs see as a problem. Um, I personally don't, 
Um, it's okay if you do, but this is um, when the players will create a series of aspects and then spend them all on a single roll with a big hit. To my mind, this is narratively like what gets done in movies and TV shows. You know, everybody's working together, doing things that help. And then finally, there's the the strike that kind of takes down the big boss or ends ends the whatever tragedy is happening. Hmm. And so this is like that is OK. Um, part of the reason why it is OK is that it's it's part of that's part of how fate is written to work. You, you're not going to like nickel and dime opponents. Like that's the least efficient way to do it. The best way to take out opponents is to create a bunch of advantages and take something down your NPCs, your opposition for the player characters can do the same thing. So what that means is, is that they can create a big stack of these um, advantages and do the same thing and, and hit them hard. Um, so this is a case where fate is working as as desired. Um, it's a feature, not a bug. And uh, you as a GM should start uh, doing your own aspect stacking for opposition. And you can also have the opposition undermining some of that aspect stacking. So what that means is, is if the players create on fire, which is, you know, the, the most popular aspect ever in fate, um, the opposition can pour water on it and put it out. So, um, so that's, that's kind of how to handle aspect stacking. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more. I know that that's something that can be like a little bit frustrating for some people. And I think I, I was reading on the re or the subreddit for fate that like some people had some very strong opinions about this. I'm happy to talk this through. If you post in the chat, I'll come back around to this and, um, and answer those questions or address like, um, whatever you have to say. All right, so zoom in on the last one here and conflict. Um, how to make combat interesting. Uh, when I ran my recent games, I found it hard to keep my players moving around the map from zone to zone. Uh, they might want to do an action, but decide against it because their stats aren't as good. Um, okay, so let's kind of dissect this a little bit. We talked about making combat interesting already, so I'm not going to reiterate that. Um, but I do want to talk about moving from zone to zone. Um, so this is one of those places, um, when I run games, uh, and have a scene or have a conflict, um, sometimes I will have zones and sometimes I will not. Um, it just depends if zones add value to the combat, then I will add them. If, if it doesn't, then I kind of don't bother with zones. Um, it depends how, how much you like maps and how much you want people to move around and make things interesting. So going back to the, to the waterfall and the escaping politician, um, I specifically made zones, you know, near side, far side of the ravine and waterfall under the waterfall. Those were the three zones, um, in the scene. And I had even told the players, I said, listen, I said, if you guys end up going down the tunnel, that'll be another zone. Um, but that was it. Uh, and so that made like moving from zone to zone, um, interesting as they did that. Um, when you want your players to move from zone to zone, you have to give them reasons to move zone to zone. And the best way to make it interesting is to make crossing the barrier from one zone to another, um, difficult. So for instance, if you had a warehouse filled with crates, um, you could have like three zones that were like in the warehouse. And then you could have like two zones that would be on top of crates and moving from like zone to zone that were, that would be empty of crates, you know, difficult because there are opponents at the, the tops of the, um, in the zones that are at the top of the boxes, like these giant all the way to the ceiling stacks. Um, who are just waiting to actually like get their eye on someone to be able to shoot them. So moving from zone to zone becomes difficult um, and it makes the map more interesting, like the, the zone map. That's, that's kind of the, the, the thing that's going to make it interesting is if the map of the area is, is interesting. So, um, you know, 
it's it's kind of um it's something that you have to play with to 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 get but one of the things that i look to for inspiration is i think about like um honestly i think about movies like the goonies um, I think about like the movie Super 8, which is a little bit more interesting. Um, I think about the different like places that are in there and getting from one spot to another um, and how that could be difficult um, because zones in um, in a conflict aren't just necessarily like parts of the room or parts of the warehouse. They can also be parts of the city. So you can have like one round of combat being like, okay, so we're fighting, um, we're fighting on the mall in DC. And then like another zone could be the Thomas Jefferson Memorial um, and have all of these different zones throughout the city where this conflict is happening. Um, And whenever it comes to having different zones, um, thinking of the scale of those zones can also be interesting. Um, as like players move. Um, one thing that I think some players, this is a little bit of a tangent, but one thing that I think some players get kind of stuck in thinking with conflicts is like six second turns. Um, it's, you know, it's been ingrained in me from years of playing Dungeons and Dragons, but the, um, oh, pardon me. The scale of time that you're working at can be dilated out to um to a larger scale so conflicts themselves like your turn for a conflict could represent hours of uh like going through the city or like you know um attacking like fighting mooks in a part of the city or something along those lines it's um it's something that really isn't i don't I don't know that it's really talked about very much in fate, but like with conflicts, you can kind of scale out that time a little bit um, and make it a little bit more interesting instead of just like, okay, we're in this room of the dungeon. We can fight. I hope that makes sense. Um, Great. So that is our question board. Uh, I hope that I've answered every question satisfactorily. Um, if I haven't, um, please leave a comment, uh, or reach out on Patreon or on Twitter, and I'm happy to follow up and, and, uh, and do, do more, uh, or, you know, clarify, build upon all of those sorts of things. Like I've said, I love fate and I love teaching it. Um, so at this point, I'm going to take a 10 minute break, um, uh, I will, so that puts me back at 2.55 Eastern in 10 minutes from now because I need some water and we're going to do um, session prep for January. So thank you all for staying around and um, I will see you all in 10 minutes. I'm going to switch back to the holding screen.
Hello. I'm back just a couple of minutes early. Uh, just stretched out. All right. So, who is ready for some GM prep? Anybody? Anybody ready for some GM prep for the next session? Great. All right. So, um, so I think what I'd like to do first is show you kind of behind the scenes what my prep looks like, um, or at least can look like. Um, and then we're going to kind of go through um, and do some, do some live planning. So the first thing I want to do is share with you, um, well, I've already shared with you my Royal Pride of Musketeers um, kind of uh, sheet here. Well, not sheet, but notebook. So this notebook, uh, in it, I have some links to some things. So I keep track of all of the different NPCs. I keep track of the plot threads. Um, and then I've got other like guilds, places, siages. Don't worry about what that is. Um, sessions and uh, religious stuff. Basically, this is my notebook for me to find things. Um, my NPC list just to show. Um, I keep it listed here, all of the different NPCs. I use little emojis for each of them. I also categorize all of my NPCs. Um, since I'm tracking this digitally, um, it's really easy to add categories to things. And this allows me to filter uh, by category very easily. So for instance, if I wanted to add a filter, I can add a filter. I could say, okay, I want categories contain uh, male. Okay. And so that will restrict my list down to all of the male, male NPCs. So you can see count 29, um, filter. I can change that. Like, Oh, what about female NPCs? Uh, 21. It's not bad. Almost 50, 50. Um, but I can also like see all sorts of different things. Um, Chelsea asks, what is this tool? This tool is Notion, uh, notion.so. So um, I just added a link. Um, you can use it at the free level um, without paying for it. And it's a great tool. Um, I'm probably gonna do some videos on using it for uh, managing a role-playing game. Um, but so this allows me to have all of these different NPCs. I can open them up um, and inside. I can have any information that I want. Um, on them. Um, so going back, let's see to the main page. Um, I also have plot threads, the plot thread section. Um, uh, you can see I've got end of game plots. This is this campaign ended about two years ago. Um, but uh, I've got major plot threads. Um, just to for me to keep track of I have um, unused plot threads from the world building session. So basically these are all things that I think could be really cool that um, you can see none of them are checked. So we never ended up uh, using them. Um, but we've got medium and minor for, for the various plots. Um, this is something that I started to do towards the end of the campaign. So um, there's not really as many as there would be otherwise. Um, I also have like random ones in here. So for instance, for the Suffamer arc, um, the player that was related to that gave me a bunch of ideas for what the area could be like and what could happen. Um, and then I also maintain a list of like ideas. So any links that might be good. Um, I add, I add like storyline ideas. This is literally just a random notebook of stuff. This is, I make this for me. So, um, it's totally, totally random with all of the different things that I have in here. Sometimes I'll write and, uh, a PC name and add a bunch of ideas. Um, or like I, this murder mystery plot that I had that I really wanted to use, but just couldn't fit it into the game. Um, and links and things like that. So I'm going to scroll back up. Um, those were plots. Um, guilds, places, and siages are just like faces, um, just lists of things. Um, and then there are sessions. So let's take a look at what a, a session might look like. Um, so session prep, let's see, I think this Suffermer one might be, no, this is not the one that I wanted. Um, High Horn Pass. Okay, so this is um, for session 34. I found some art. I like to make stuff for myself look pretty too. So I found this nice piece of art for the uh, High Horn Pass. And then I wrote 
um, basically what is going on in the high horn pass. A um, little bit of the history of it. Um, I did brainstorming to figure out what I wanted to do for the area and I wrote it down. Um, most of this information was communicated to the players um, uh, and anything that wasn't, uh, you know, uh, could be used again later. Um, uh, there's a crocagator or a velocigator, I think is what I ended up calling it. Um, and then I've got like what's going on in the present day. Um, and then I listed out all of the forces in play. So the Stagladian Lord, the Hands of Liberty, uh, Maud Dumont, Misalov, and former Captain Herno. And I have like lists of like just bulleted lists to remind me of all the things that I've been thinking about. Um, you know, so for instance, this Maud Dumont, who is a prestidigitator, um, uh, is holding at the High Horn Pass, waiting for the Chondral Army to arrive. Uh, in my mind, I know like what her goals and ambitions are. So this is literally as as just as much as I need to run a game because it's a bulleted list of things that I kind of already know. Um, I've written down here what the players should learn when they're in the High Horn Pass. Um, so these are kind of like the goals that I have for the story arc. Like I, they should know that, um, you know. Uh, one of Earthel's three dragons is moving with the army and that dragon's name is Zustarad the Bullfire, you know, and a little bit about Zustarad and then some other information. Um, and then I also have some uh, NPCs, a filtered list uh, of what might be needed. And then I just go into like, I've got the more information about the stag lady and Lord, some art, um, and then just some additional information that I might need. Um, the next session, just to show this, um, what I do is I'll have a previously to remind me what happened. Um, and then I will list out NPCs and a bulleted list of what they're trying to do now. You know, based on what happened in the previous session, you know, I will um, update what these NPCs want. I will list a, out some events that I'd like to have happen in the session. Um, whether or not they do, well, that's up to, up to the PC sometimes. And then I also list out a bunch of interesting locations. Again, I have interesting NPCs, interesting locations. I can put them together as I need to, um, to, to have things happen. Um, and if you want, these are the stats for the Velocigator image that you saw, um, and then again, just the list of uh, NPCs if I need it uh, to access. And this is this is generally what my prep looks like. So the what we're looking at right now are my are literally the notes that I ran these games from. So, excuse me. Uh, let's see. This one I've got random notes from um, uh, what happened during the session. Uh, I found some art that I wanted for inspiration for some characters. And then again, I've got previously on and I've got the NPCs. Um, you can see the events here. I've, I've added events that have happened. Um, and then I've got like locations. Um, this one featured a one, this was them defending uh, a bridge. And so I really like uh, built out the bridge itself for this session. Uh, and just kind of continue again. Like this is, this is what my prep looks like. This is why um, I personally like using uh, digital tools for GM prep because I can actually, you know, uh, find things a lot faster. So for instance, you know, I know that like, okay, so the stag lady wants to kill her no for et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, oh, I need some more information about the stag lady. I click on the stag lady and I can go and I can check out like, okay, so I've statted her up. Up. Um, and if I had any other notes in here, uh, I would be able to reference those notes. Some of the NPCs I have statted out like this, other NPCs, um, I literally don't have statted out. I just have like bulleted lists of this person does this and does that. Um, and I stat them out whenever I think there's a, a, a slight chance that they might be needed. Um, this was an NPC who got statted out, but actually didn't end up needing to be used for anything. Surprisingly, they killed her immediately with one shot. Um, it was, it was a great scene. Uh, and I applaud the player characters for that. Um, so let's see. So that's, that's kind of what my notes look like. 
So let's um, let's go and take a look at the Learn to Play Fate board. So this board, if you uh, watched the uh, November stream of uh, Learn to Play Fate, uh, this is the board where I have everybody's character sheets. So we've got Moira Haskell, we have John Harrington, we've got Reverend C.J. Haggard, and Herbert Peacock Hessenwing, um, and uh, we have all of their different all of their character sheets. I, as a GM, like to have copies of all of my character, all of my players' character sheets. The reason for that is that I like to look at the character sheets and make sure that I'm providing the players with what they want, uh, both in terms of challenges and things to explore, and also that I'm challenging them appropriately. Like, I don't want to make something too hard or too easy um, unless I'm intentionally trying to make something too hard or too easy. Um, so... Um, because this is a, a new game and, uh, we did session zero last time, uh, talking through what we wanted, uh, but I didn't do any of my usual kind of planning for future sessions because at the time, uh, I didn't think that there was going to be a second session. So what this means is that, um, you and I are going to go through this and we're going to do some of my planning. So the, whenever I kick off a new, um, new campaign or a new character is involved, um, what I like to do is I like to take everybody's aspects um, and I've already done this. I've taken their aspects and because gear is important for this game, um, I've written down their gear as well here in Miro. And what we're going to do is we're going to reveal this. <coughs> Pardon me. And so what we have here is a listing of everybody's aspects. And the reason that I do this is I like to group the aspects and make connections between the aspects to try and generate plot ideas. Okay. So um, the way that I usually do this is actually on paper. I'll usually write down everybody's aspects and I'll start drawing lines between everybody. Um, and it's really crazy. I go through a bunch of paper um, doing that. Um, I didn't want to do that for this live stream. I wanted to, to make it uh, use some digital tools to make the presentation better. So this is actually my first time doing something like this in Miro. So um, if we're, if I may end up, uh, if it looks like I'm not sure what I'm doing, it's because I'm not sure what I'm doing. Um, so I'm being vulnerable right now. Be kind. All right. So, uh, let's take a look at the aspects that we have. Let me zoom in so that as I read them. So we have Mora, who is a widow who turned to a life of crime. She is wanted by the law and she is impulsive. Uh, she has a magic ammo bag. Uh, Harrington is a smooth talking con artist. Um, it is past time he cashed out and the marks practically con themselves and has a shimmering mask. Um, if you remember from the session, the shimmering mask is powered by souls. That's going to be interesting. Um, the Reverend is a gun toning preacher is too clean for the West. Life is a pulpit and has the twin pistols, thoughts and prayers. Uh, Peacock is Madame Charlotte's flashy confidant and bouncer, is mourning the mysterious death of uh, their parents, uh, is first sweet, then sour, and has a gifted arcane peacock cane. All right, so we've got a lot of things to work with here. Um, the very first thing that I'm gonna kind of pull out is um, Madame Charlotte's flashy and confident, or confidant and bouncer. So the way that I ran the first session, the session back in November was that Madam Charlotte had kind of gathered everybody together to, uh, to make sure that they were able to, um, uh, stop the demon from getting all of the gold that it wanted. Um, and whenever they returned back, Madam Charlotte gave them a good pat on the back and said, good job. So Madam Charlotte's going to kind of probably be at the, the center of things that are going on. So, uh, I'm going to pull out that aspect to represent that. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at all of these different aspects that are here and I'm going to be like, how can we relate Madame Charlotte to some of these other aspects? Okay. Um, so, um, let's see, looking at Moira, she turned to a life of crime. Uh, Madame Charlotte, like how does, how does crime and Madame Charlotte go together? Um, 
you know, do we want to have that kind of relationship there? Not sure. Let's think about that. Um, let's look the uh, gifted arcane peacock cane. Um, now, or yeah, this should probably go together with Madame Charlotte. Um, these are both from the same character, but I want to build kind of a relationship between them. Um, let's go ahead and change the color of that line so it's a little bit more visible. Um, and so now there's a connection between these two. So Madame Charlotte um, maybe uh, gave the peacock cane to Peacock. We're not sure, but let's let's kind of uh, look at some of these other aspects and see how we can kind of bring them together. So um, let's look. The marks practically con themselves. So maybe what we want to do, this Harrington, maybe we want to bring Harrington in um, with Madame Charlotte because Madame Charlotte, um, we've established that she has an understanding of the supernatural and what's going on. And so Madame Charlotte might need some con work done, like some um, some confidence man work done, but maybe it's to to help um, with everything that's going on supernaturally. So let's draw a connection there. Um, and so like Harrington wants to get out by this pat past time I cashed out. Um, so maybe by using his abilities to like con the supernatural, that's a way for Harrington to justify getting out, uh, of being a con man while still, um, like giving into like some of his problems. So that might be um, a good connection there. And let's, let's create one more connection um, here with, with Madam Charlotte out of everything that's going on. If anyone has any ideas, uh, they are welcome to post them into the chat. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, what could we add? Uh, we can add Moira, but then we've got three characters together. Maybe we want to try and bring the Reverend in with Madame Charlotte. Um, uh, maybe we can bring in Life as a Pulpit from the Reverend. So what this could be is um, the Reverend... Uh, maybe Madame Charlotte wants the Reverend to kind of try and uh, help the town a little bit um, from a spiritual sense, not not necessarily in fighting the supernatural, probably that too, but also in earnestly trying to help what's going on um, in the town, uh, which we've not talked about town or anything, but I'm going to select these and I'm going to take this cluster and be like, okay, I like this cluster right here with Madame Charlotte. Um, she's going to get Harrington to, to do some work for her. She's got Peacock doing, uh, doing work for her and it gifted the cane. Um, and then the Reverend is tied in there. So let's, let's create another cluster here. So Moira is the one who doesn't have anything yet. So let's, let's look at Moira and grab her widow who turned to a life of crime. All right. So um, how can we bring this together? Um, what we can do is um, we can tie Moira to, um, let's tie Moira and Peacock together. And um, we're going to, to make this connection. Oh, that was weird. Let's uh, do that. All right. so. I'm making this connection. Moira is a widow who turned to a life of crime and Peacock is mourning the mysterious death of their parents. Um, there's going to be a relationship um, between those deaths. Not sure what it is yet, um, but I like the idea of bringing this of Harrison's shimmering mask, bring it down here and getting this mask involved. So maybe there's something that's tying these together. Maybe there's um, the deaths are tied somehow to the shimmering mask because the mask, if you remember, uh, is fueled by souls. So maybe before uh, Harrington got the shimmering mask, uh, there was something more to it or entirely possible. Maybe uh, Harrington was involved. We don't know. Um, so let's 
uh, take a look at what else we have here. Gun Tony Preacher for Sweet Then Sour. Uh, I think this is going to be a good cluster right here. Oh, let me select all of these. Um, and let's see what we have left and see if there are any kind of um, obvious relationships that we can make out of the remaining aspects. Now, we don't have to make relationships out of all of the aspects, but having relationships out of some of them, that's that's good. So let's see. Harrington is a smooth talking con artist. Moira is wanted by the law and is impulsive. There's a magic ammo bag and the Reverend has thoughts and prayers. Let's, um, I want to remind myself of thoughts and prayers. So I'm going to go back to the Trello board. Um, let's take a look at thoughts and prayers. Um, let's see. So two six guns, hold on. Let me actually copy and paste that out of here. Um, it is those are a little bit long for that area. So we have twin six guns touched by the angel Gabriel. Blessed to ha send Hellspong back where they belong and compelled to right wrongs. Um, that is interesting. Let's go ahead and uh, close that. Now I want to look at the magic ammo bag. So um, the magic... Ammo was created by Mora's late husband, and it fires shells that cast spells. Great. Um, let's see. What is the flaw? The flaw for this, I think, is that it um, the spells can backfire or be useless. Okay. Um, I'd, I think, I mean, it kind of makes sense to bring the magic ammo bag and thoughts and prayers kind of together. Um, and so... Um, Let's make a relationship here Boop. Uh, between these two. Excuse me, sorry. And let's see if there's anything else that we can kind of bring together here. Um, I mean, gun-toting preacher uh, can come down here too. <clears throat> we can make this an important element. Oh, and then is there anything for Harrington to do. Um, let's bring Harrington down here um, and bring this all kind of together. Cause what I want to do is I kind of want the, um, the mystery of the ammo bag and more his husband uh, to kind of um, tie into that. So what I have now from these aspects, let me go ahead and move these. This, these are like the others that I haven't related together. Um, but now I've got some clusters of these. So this one here is going to be all about the like Moira's husband and the mystery behind the magic ammo bag and how it might relate to the guns that the gun toting preacher has. Um, and there's a relationship to Harrington. Um, that the reason that I've got this down here is I think that that's going to be, that's going to be a real loose connection. Um, but I want to keep that down here. We've got more return to a life of crime. Um, and the reason that she turned to a life of crime was the, um, the death of her husband. And so that, um, Oh, that death. Let's see. You know what? I'm going to actually just kind of change the relationship a little bit. I want to um, make Peacock's Morning the center of this. And the reason for that is that with the bag of ammo up above being uh, very Moira centric, this one up here, um, I want to make this a little bit more Peacock centric. So he's mourning the mysterious death of his parents. Um, and we can lean into that and it can relate to um, what happened with Moira and uh, potentially the shimmering mask. And then lastly, down here, um, we've got, uh, let me actually just change kind of the direction that this is going. Um, so Madam Charlotte is um, kind of tying Harrington and the Peacock Cane and um, the Reverend's life as a, a pulpit together. So 
by clustering these, you can see that so far we've already got some ideas for how to bring the, the characters together a little bit more and to, um, to begin tying their stories together. Um, and by doing this work, we're able to, um, uh, to know a little bit more instinctively while we play what we kind of like to do. So right now I want to dive a little bit deeper into, um, one of these. Um, and I, I see that there are some people in chat. So, um, I'd like to know which one you would like me to dive into. Do we want me to dive into the magic ammo bag? Do we want me to dive into the mysterious death of Peacock's parents? Or do we want to dive a little bit more into Madame Charlotte's, uh, uh, her connection between all of the different player characters? I'm interested to know you, the viewer, which one you think um, I should dive a little bit more deeply into. I will give you all a moment in the chat if anyone has any opinions. The magic ammo bag, mourning the mysterious death of Peacock's parents, or Madame Charlotte. All right, no one is responding in chat. That's cool, I understand. It is a Saturday at a little bit past three, at least, you know, uh, here on the East Coast. So I will go ahead and choose one. Um, I think that I would like to dive a little bit more into, um, I think it's gonna be Madame Charlotte. And the reason for that is that Madame Charlotte's is probably gonna be a little bit more, like that story here is probably gonna be a little bit more um, a social interaction. Um, I think that um, uh, the morning, the mysterious death is a bit more um, investigative. Um, and this magic ammo bag, um, I think that this is probably going to be a storyline that's a little bit more action oriented um, since it is about guns and ammo. Um, so let's go ahead and dive a little bit deeper into what is going on down here. So what I'm going to do is I've got uh, Madame Charlotte. I'm going to change the color to kind of just indicate that she's sort of the center of the universe here. Uh, and I'm going to move some of these uh, around. Let me shrink that map. All right, so now we've got all of these great connections. And now what I wanna do is I want to, to add some more detail into some of these. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring out, let's see, uh, that is a post-it note. Uh, I suppose a post-it note will do. Um, let me just change the, nope, that's not what I wanted. I wanted to change the shape. There we go, uh, a wide post-it note. Um, this connection right here between Madame Charlotte, oh, let me move that so we can all see it. Uh, Madame Charlotte and Life is a Pulpit, um, the town uh, is getting spooked uh, and needs a calming influence. Okay, so this relationship is about um, this the town getting spooked and needing a calming influence. Let's go ahead and create another card. Let's talk about um, creating or adding Madame Charlotte and uh, Harrington. Um, so what we need is a, a con. We need some kind of reason for Harrington uh, to be pulled into a, a con. Um, that Madame Charlotte is doing. So I think, so we've done the train heist. Um, let's, I tell you what, um, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet today was a, um, uh, a thread that I had posted to Twitter. Um, some of you may have seen it. I posted it um, as, as the Fate SRD, talking about having a little bit of some inspiration. Let me just switch accounts over to the Fate SRD and talk through that. So when my brain is in campaign mode, um, I'm suddenly thinking like, oh, what's going on? Um, looking for inspiration uh, everywhere that I can find it. Um, and this was the tail end of that thread. So, um, so I, earlier this week was, um, I got an email from Wells Fargo that had, uh, this stagecoach image at the bottom of the email. 
And I thought, oh, well, I'm running a, a Wild West game soon. I, I wonder what Wells Fargo has to do with stagecoaches. Because if it's important enough for them to have it in their email, they something significant must have happened. So I went to their Wikipedia page and I saw that Wells Fargo, a company called Holiday, which was a stagecoach uh, company and Overland Mail Stage Lines um, all merged into Wells Fargo in 1866. And I'm like, that's very interesting. Um, then I read a little bit more and Wells Fargo's stagecoach stagecoach business took a nosedive as railroads started to crisscross the country. Um, so my idea was to have the PCs investigate the merger and have them get a big boon tied to the success of the stagecoach coach biz. Um, you know, the players get a cool reward of maybe like some stock and it makes them wealthy. Um, and then I also posted like, you know, in a future arc, uh, you know, maybe the railroads start to threaten the stagecoach success. Um, and then suddenly there's an out a challenge where the PCs have to choose, like, do they want to continue to maintain their wealth or do they want to, um, uh, do something, um, or, or do the right thing. So I can make them kind of have to make a hard decision. So I think that this idea of these, um, companies coming together, um, Wells Fargo, uh, holiday and overland mail stage lines coming together. Um, that might be a good underpinning for what Madam Charlotte, uh, needs done. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add that as a post-it note here. Um, then I'm going to add, um, I'm going to just re-add that we need a con that relates to this. So, um, what this could be is, um, maybe these companies are do are gathering and it's not known what's going on and the town is getting spooked. So maybe, um, hmm, hmm, sorry, I'm just, uh, my, my brain is not running as fast as my mouth and I ran out of words. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes it does. Um, so, uh, let's see. Oh, Hey, Astrid is back. Hi, Astrid. I hope you're having fun and learning, uh, cause you're going to be GMing for me whenever I retire. Um, so we need a bank, uh, stage coach biz and, uh, male stage coach. So let's just make it a male, uh, a bank and stagecoach, let me zoom in just a little bit, um, is going to be the, um, what we need here. And let's say that the, so we can make one of these kind of related to the supernatural, either the bank or the stagecoach. Um, hmm. I'm going to say the, the stagecoach. Let's make the stagecoach, um, stagecoach con. All right. So we need some kind of, uh, stagecoach con. I'm thinking that maybe, um, uh, there are divine, uh, guardians for coaches. Like maybe there are some kind of, um, maybe there is a collection of, uh, good supernatural powers that kind of look over like work on one of the stagecoach companies. Um, and, uh, they are hmm, running out of ideas. So, uh, when that runs out of steam, uh, I'm going to add down here. Uh, let's see. Uh, hello again, Astrid. I see you in the chat. Uh, let's see. So Madam Charlotte and the Peacock Cane. Um, so what we need to do is think a little bit about this Peacock Cane. Let's go back to our list uh, of players and let's take a look at what they've got listed for the Peacock Cane. Um, so it is an arcane Peacock Cane and the source of power is unknown. Um, let's see it, the stunt that it has which I can't see is great advantage when with the sieve when calling attention to himself. All right. So, 
so I'm wondering, so, uh, to try and like get some more seeds for this, I'm wondering like, are there any, like, what do peacock, what are peacocks a symbol for? Um, so I'm going to type in peacock symbol um, into uh, Google and see what we turn up with. We've got peacock symbolism and meeting and meaning. Um, uh, all right. Um, what does a peacock symbolize? The main characteristics linked with peacock uh, medicine include long life, leadership, beauty, sophistication, dignity, psychic vision, love and pride. Huh. Um, in Hinduism, peacock remains in uh, Lakshmi, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the goddess of compassion, for fortune, and fortitude, uh, god of rain and thunder, harbingers of rain. Okay, so what we can do is let's take this, I'm going to copy it. Um, and, um, this peacocks being harbingers of rain, let's copy these back over here as some post-it notes and see, um, what starts to, to pop up as we think. I know that this isn't super exciting, but this is, this is my, uh, kind of GMing process. Um, so what does it symbolize, uh, medicine, or uh, long life, leadership, beauty, sophistication, dignity, psychic vision, love and pride, harbingers of rain. Um, so this really ties into like the start of an idea I have here for divine guardians for coaches. Um, and so um, what I think, oh, cool. All right, so the Stagecoach Con just had an idea. Um, this con, um, what it can be is that um, the, oh, what is it? The, uh, the bank, uh, the bank uh, hires uh, the madam uh, to learn more about uh, an item of power from the coaches. Oh, I did not mean to create that post-it note. Um, so the, the bank is going to hire the madam to learn more about an item of power from the divine guardians, um, uh, an item of power, uh, that was lost by the divine guardians. Okay. Um, the, the, the bank wants to know, wants leverage in the conversation. Uh, the bank wants to be able to say, Hey, we managed to find the, like this, this lost artifact to get a better deal on the merger between the bank and the stagecoach, which is great. Um, so now what this means is that Harrington here is going to um, basically be our con man who's going to our confidence man who's going to go and try and find out from these guardians what that thing that they might have lost was uh, and what we're oh. I did not mean to do that. Uh, what we're going to do, though, is it turns out that the item that they lost. Oh, oh. Uh, is going to be the um, this uh, arcane peacock cane. So what this does is this introduces complexity because we're going to learn that it's the cane. And now suddenly this item that peacock has, um, Harrington is going to know is going to be a lost um, item of the divine guardians. And that's going to create like some stress in the group because the bank is going to want to know about, or Madam Charlotte is going to want to know about it. So, uh, Harrington needs to decide whether it, he is going to tell Madam Charlotte about it. And if he does tell Madam Charlotte about it, then we have to worry about the relationship between Madam Charlotte and Peacock and that Peacock cane. So we've got, we're going to have questions there about like, what, like, is she going to force him to turn it over? Is it going to be, is there going to be money offered, um, et cetera. So that creates a, we're kind of like creating some things around here. Now we've got the Reverend up here and, and they're kind of hanging out here um, without um, a, a good thing. So let's, let's talk about the bank a little bit more. What, you know, banks, um, in my opinion, banks are evil. 
So my my assumption is banks are evil. So what what do we want to do with that? Um, so the bank wants to buy the stagecoach, which has divine guardians. Uh, the bank is going to be backed by some sort of um, uh, 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 evil group now the question with evil is like does it have to be supernatural evil or can it be human evil um i think it would be interesting to be human evil trying to uh merge with the stagecoach business with the divine guardians um because that creates a conflict of human evil versus divine good and trying to kind of like bring that together um so uh the uh the bank because the bank is doing something important maybe um oh goodness maybe there's some some evil things happening um let's see uh evil portents portents uh happen here so maybe there are some evil portents that are happening um as a result of um ceremonies by evil bankers um and so what this means is, is that the reverend has to get involved because the town is spooked because there are like like uh cows are dying randomly there are like all sorts of different sort of like biblical signs if you will um and that kind of goes back to some of the things that the players wanted in the game anyway which was they really wanted this strong good versus evil like kind of vibe um you know faith and and no faith um so um uh, this evil portents from the banker uh because of ceremonies from the bankers um how let's see so scaling back here a little bit we've got We've got a decent connection between three of the characters. The one that's kind of not involved at all is um, Moira. So let's, uh, now that we've got this developed a little bit more, let's bring Moira into it. So what about Moira can we bring in? We've got, she's impulsive. She's wanted by the law. Let's, let's bring in this wanted by the law thing here. Um, so... Uh, we'll bring Moira in and Moira being wanted by the law is going to complicate things with the, um, the stagecoach divine guardians, because let's say that the relationship between Moira and the stagecoach divine guardians, um, isn't that great. Um, let's say that, um, Moira, uh, robbed the stagecoach many times. Um, so what this means is that Moira is not a favorite of the divine guardians at all, um, which makes, uh, everything in here just a little bit more, um, kind of complicated and let's make it even more complicated. The, the rob the stagecoach many times, um, it turns out that's how the, um, let's dropped it to the bottom. That's how the um, Peacock Cane originally went missing from the Divine Guardians. Okay, so this is coming together pretty well. Um, anyone in the chat have any questions or ideas that they'd like to contribute on top of this? All right, I'm not seeing any responses. That's okay. Um, I can keep going. Um, so let's just kind of to, to review this where we're going, because I'd like to move on to creating some, uh, some characters. Let's talk about this. So, um, uh, Madam Charlotte, uh, is hired by, um, an evil bank, although like we're not going to know necessarily know that it's evil to get leverage against the stagecoach company, which is run by like divine guardians, some sort of, uh, angels. Um, and Harrington is going to be called upon by Madam Charlotte to, to do that work. Um, uh, that leverage is going to come in the, the form of something that was lost by the divine guardians. And if Harrington can, uh, kind of source it and find it, um, then the bank will pay handsomely for that. Um, Madam Charlotte, um, uh, gave the peacock cane to the character named peacock, um, and uh, let's see the um, so it being a peacock cane ties into the symbolism of the peacock. Um, excuse me. 
Uh, the town is getting spooked because there are evil portents that are happening as a result of ceremonies by evil bankers, which brings the, the reverend in to, excuse me, need to take care of this. Um, Moira has robbed the stagecoach many times, and actually one of her robberies led to the, the peacock cane. Now, my thought is that it would have been in a box and Moira maybe didn't see it. Or if she did, it was like one of those things that you don't really pay attention to until it gets uh, pointed out. So um, so this gives us a little bit of some some intertwining of things going on here. Um, so now what I want to do um, now that I've I've got this this mapped out is I want to come up with some NPCs. Um, just super, super loose NPCs. Um, so what I'm going to do is we know that we're going to need, um, uh, an evil banker NPC. So let's go ahead and switch up to a post-it note. Let's make the NPC cards this, uh, no, that's not quite different enough. Let's make it this green color. Um, we need an evil banker, oh, uh, for, for what's happening over here. Um, we need um, a divine guardian uh, for the stagecoach company. Uh, let's see, we've got Madame Charlotte, but let's go ahead and um, add her to the list because she is not statted out or anything like that. Madame Charlotte. Um, and then let's... Um, you know, we could actually make the peacock cane a little bit more interesting and the uh, peacock cane um, itself could be an NPC. Now, I don't mean this in the bronze rule sort of way. I mean that the peacock cane um, could indeed itself um, be um, a sapient thing. Maybe as part of like what's going on here, um, the peacock cane could make a decision to stay with the character peacock. Um, and that gives us a fallback in case like, um, Madam Charlotte decides to try and get the peacock, give the peacock cane back to the divine guardians that gives us a fail safe so that the player doesn't lose something that they've spent time, uh, crafting and paying, for um, during character development and stuff. So that's um, that's an idea that we can have and we can keep that in our back pocket. If we use it, great. If we don't use it, that's also okay. Um, great, so we've got some, some NPCs that we need to stat. Um, so let's go ahead and um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I'm gonna grab the um, Oh, the, the planning board here, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger. Uh, zoom in, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make, select each of these. Uh, I'm gonna make a copy of it, uh, of them. And then I'm going to, let's see, I want to, nope, that's not what I wanted to do. I just wanted to make that a little bit neater um, for doing uh, PC or for NPC creation anyway. Let's see, let's space these out. Grab all of those and great. So we've got these NPCs. So let's talk about how to make NPCs. So um, any method for using, for creating NPCs is, is perfectly acceptable and perfectly fine. Um, what my process typically is, let's see, I need to actually activate a another, another camera. camera. Boom. Boom, let, let me, me close, close that. that. Um, um, so, so what you're what looking, looking at right, at right now, now hi, uh, is, is a collection, a collection of, cards of cards that, that I use. I use. Um, and, and I use these cards. cards. Let's 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 that. That. Um, I, use I use these cards, cards the, the short order cards, cards the, the writer's, writer's emergency, emergency pack, pack, the non-player non cards. cards. Oh, oh turn, turn tracker cards. cards. What are those doing there? Just blatant product placement for or something, something I made, I made. Um, um, and, and I, I and the and backstory, backstory cards. cards. Now, now uh, the backstory, backstory cards are great for for, um, for session, session zero, zero stuff. stuff. They're great, They're great for tying um, NPCs, NPCs and PCs together. together whenever you have, have like you know, you know something, something had happened in the past, past like maybe there was, there was a big heist that people, that people were involved in. We're not going to use the backstory cards today because that honestly would be its own video. They are the backstory cards are amazing. I do recommend. Them. Them. 
um, the, the writer, writer emergency, emergency pack. pack. Um, this, this is good for whenever you're trying, trying to come, come up with a uh, plot and you, and you want, want to solve, solve that problem. problem. You can, you can actually, actually uh, draw, draw a card. Let me go, go ahead and, and uh, pull, pull one out here. here. Uh, the, uh, the way, way that, that it works is, is that um, you basically are pulling out um, one, one random, random card from the stack. stack. So, so you have, you have a, a stack, stack of cards, cards right here, here. And, you and you pull one, one random, random card. card. Okay. And, and this, this random card, card uh, it says that's not the dragon. Um, you, thought you thought that, that was, was the enemy? enemy? Nope. nope. The, the real, real danger, danger lies ahead. ahead. So, so what, what we, we do is, is with the writer's, writer's cards, cards is, is we would then, then take, and we see that it has a number up here. It's got the number 24. Um, there, there is, is a, a corresponding, corresponding another, another card, card in here, in here. Um, that, that is, is card number 24. 24. Um, and, and it contains further details, details on what you can do to um, use, use this to try, try and uh, help, help your story. Your story. So, so, for instance, instance here, here we, we have... have uh, uh, you know what, you know I'm going to have to take, take that away so I can read it. It says, bait the trap, list three things that can be used to lure your hero into danger. Picture the puppet master who's pulling the strings. And, and heroes, heroes can have can puppets, puppets too. too. Um, so, so that gives us a bunch of ideas for how to resolve, resolve a particular plot if we run into some kind of, of, of hole uh, or, you know, you know something, something that we're not, we're not able, able to uh, overcome, overcome just by, just by ourselves. ourselves. Um, um, having having prompts, prompts like that, like I, I, I find, are really helpful when writing a story. Well, you know, writing... Anything, Anything, honestly. honestly. So, so I am putting, putting those, those away, away right, right now, now, and then, and then we'll, we'll talk, talk about, about the non-player non cards. cards. The non-player non cards, cards are by Metal Weave Games. games. Um, I, don't I don't know that they, they offer them as cards, cards anymore. anymore. They, they do, do have, have them as a, a uh, as a PDF, PDF that, that you can, can purchase and roll, roll on tables. tables. Um, um, but basically, basically what, what these do, do they, they allow us to, like this goals one right here, it allows us to open up the deck, and, uh, uh, you, know, you know, look, look at, the at the deck and pull, pull one randomly. randomly. And, and so, so for, for instance, instance, this one this says manipulation. manipulation. People, People are tools, tools to be used, used and like, like any, any good tool, tool, they need to be properly, properly kept. kept. So, so this is a, a goal. goal. And, and so, so this could be added to an NPC as one of their goals. goals. Um, I'm going to be using the goals deck, so I'm going to go ahead and leave that out. It's not on camera right now, it's off to the side. Um, there's uh, uh, NPC personalities, uh, there, uh, there, are there are relationships, there are professen professions, professions. There, there are secrets, secrets. I'm, I'm going to be using the secret one today, today as, well. as well, and there, and there are, are traits. traits. Um, um, I, really I really like, like these cards. cards. Um, um, I, I prefer, prefer the, the card over, over the cards over the PDFs, PDFs uh, because, because I'm actually... I'm actually um, it, it slows things, things down, down a little bit. bit. Whenever, Whenever you roll, roll on a table, table um, it's, it's really, really easy to say, nah, nah and move on to the next thing. Nah, nah, move on to the next. Um, um, I, I much I prefer, prefer to draw cards and, and, and see what's, what's going, going on, on with that. that. The, the very, very last, last thing that I have here are the short order heroes. This is a giant stack of short order heroes. And what they are is they they are various... Uh, ideas, ideas and inspirations and that you can, can use for creating, for creating your characters. characters. So, so, for instance, instance the, first the first one here is blind. Uh, the, next the next one, one thrilling. thrilling. So, so like, like these, these are adjectives, adjectives that you can, can uh, or, or descriptors, descriptors that you can, you can add, add to your, your characters, characters um, or your or NPCs, NPCs, and we can get some ideas from that. So let's go ahead and we're going to. I'm going to use draw two short order cards. Okay, let okay, me let go, go ahead, ahead and, and do this, this here. here. This is the very this first time, time I've tried, tried using, using my phone to, to, to also, also do this, this. so I'm, I'm hoping, hoping that this works, works out okay. okay. Um, I'm, I'm going, going to draw, draw a secret. secret. Uh, uh, an, an abuser? abuser? No, nope. nope. I am I'm not, not going, going to use, use an abuser. An abuser. That, that is too, um, that's too content, content warning, warning, warning e. uh, uh, illegitimate, illegitimate child. child. And, and you know what, I drew that one before. before. Let's draw another, another goal. goal. And the and goal, goal is, is going to be laughter. laughter. Weird, Weird goal, goal, but you know, you know somebody's, somebody's got to be a comedian. comedian. So let's, uh, uh, let's, let's take a look, look at, at our board, board which, which is here. here. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, actually, actually, let me, let me just go ahead and 
uh, move, move some, some things, things on the here in OBS. OBS. I'm going to move, move this, this down, down a little, a little bit, bit to the side. side. There we, there go. we go. Now, now we're, we're going, going to, to uh, take, take a, a look, look at, at we're going to do the evil, evil banker, banker first. first. Now, now it, usually, usually I pick, I pick which, one which one I'm going, going to do first, first and then I draw the cards. cards. Uh, I've, I've done, done it in op the opposite here, here because, because I was just super excited about drawing out cards. And trying to get some of that camera echo from the other camera. Thank you. There. I've turned that off. My apologies for the echo. I did not see that there was another audio bar. Um, so thank you, Chelsea, for uh, pointing out the uh, the echo. And I'm glad that somebody's still paying attention because I've been talking for almost four hours straight now. Um, it's as though I am running a campaign uh, or running a session. So let's talk about the evil banker. So the, with the evil banker, um, we know that the um, the evil banker is uh, blind. All right. Um, we know that the evil blanker evil banker is thrilling all right thank you chelsea for confirming that it is fixed now yes um awesome uh they are an ill illegit let me get the spelling on that right child hey astrid is playing minecraft awesome uh i hope you're having a great time playing minecraft astrid Thank you so much for being my biggest fan, kiddo. Uh, I am her biggest fan. Uh, and then laughter uh, is the goal. All right. So we've got this, this evil banker here who has all of these different um, attributes. So how can we bring these together in ways that make our evil banker? Um, so let's say our, our evil banker is blind. Okay. Um, so what does that mean? Does it, is it, so our evil banker, um, we talked about them just being humans. So the evil banker is going to be human, um, and is just going to be blind. Um, so the question that I ask is why is the, the banker blind? Um, is it something that happened in a mundane fashion? Did they give it up for power? Um, uh, so I'm going to say, um, Mm. You know, I'm going to say that this human, uh, this evil banker gave up their eyes for power, um, gave up eyes for, for power. Um, we can think about exactly what power later, but maybe that ties into some of the, uh, the bankers. Um, oh, let's see. Um, yeah, they gave up their eyes for the power to see uh, the market's future. That's it. So this evil banker gave up their eyes uh, for the power to see like the future of the market so that they could be better at business and understand things. And so like, this is what the banker like struck a deal with a devil to, um, to, to, to get rid of their eyes. I think that that, um, that ties really well into the banker part. Now, thrilling is one of the other, uh, kind of, uh, adjectives here. So how do we tie thrilling into the banker? Um, uh, let's see. So the banker is a human. So maybe the, um, uh, oh, thrilling likes, um, gambling. Cause, uh, the art on the card that we see there, um, it's got a, uh, kind of a, a casino sort of vibe. So let's play off that casino vibe. Um, and let's say loves, uh, casinos, uh, maybe owns the one in town. Yeah, I like that. So this evil banker um, loves casinos and owns the casino in town. Um, I know evil banker, evil casino owner, like this is kind of getting into trope territory, um, but that's okay. Uh, tropes are tropes um, sort of for reasons. So it allows us to kind of shortcut like this evil banker human owns the casino. 
like uh, yeah it kind of kind of goes really well i mean we've got like this mr burns with no eyes vibe going on so i think that um i think that that's okay um don't be scared or afraid of leaning into tropes um uh that's okay you know it helps the helps the players understand you know where things are going and they can focus their attention on things faster um the one thing that i would ask is you know be considerate of uh like stereotypes um stereotypes are something that we should probably all avoid um but there's there's can can be a line sometimes between stereotype and trope um err on the side of of you know um trying not to offend people. So, um, illegitimate child. So that card, which I'm going to go ahead and pick up so I can read it says you are the illegitimate child of someone who would rather keep the relationship to them discreet. You might be related to a noble or someone from another race or background whose relations with your other parent would, parent would cause a scandal. Okay. So the evil banker human, um, could be an illegitimate child. That is very interesting. Let's zoom back out. Um, and let's take a look at what we've got going on in play. Um, uh, we could make it someone who is the illegitimate child of Madame Charlotte. We don't know how old Madame Charlotte is or how old the banker is. Um, so it is, uh, entirely possible that, um, uh, Madame Charlotte uh, had an illegitimate child, and that was the banker. Um, uh, let's see, we've got uh, Divine Guardian here. We've got the Peacock Cane. Um, let's zoom back out a little bit more. Let's take a look at our other like areas we can or other like kind of uh, idea maps. Let's see, uh, Harrington is. Um, so Chelsea mentions, what if instead they have an illegitimate child? Um, that is an excellent, excellent idea. So let's go ahead and zoom back in here. All right. Um, and um, so the evil bank banker human has an illegitimate child. But what do we want to do with that illegitimate child? Do we want to um, uh, make the child part of the ceremonies that he is doing? Uh, I think the answer is yes, because a child in danger, that motivates player characters, let me tell you. Um, and um, I think that might be interesting. So we could make the child part of the ceremonies, but not like a baby. Like maybe it's a, a six or a seven-year-old. Um, I happen to have a seven-year-old who's probably watching right now. And we could make this child, um, we can kind of invert expectations a little bit. And the player characters are going to want to help this child. And maybe the child is like bought in completely to this, this like devilish lifestyle. Um, and is in fact, like kind of part of the opposition of what's going on. Um, bought into the dark lifestyle. I think that that works out really well. Now that means we've got another uh, NPC to make, but um, honestly, this really is a sub of the evil banker person. So um, I'm not going to go through this process for, uh, for this illegitimate child. And then laughter um, is the last card here for a goal. Let me give this a read and see what we can come up with. Laughter is ambrosia to you. Hearing it, hearing it created by your words and deeds feel, fills you with joy and immense sense of satisfaction. You seek to teach, enlighten, and entertain with laughter, something you hold close to your heart. Um, I think that for laughter, I think it's um, maybe the banker is an entertainer at heart. Um, you know, maybe that's why they own the casino. Um, loves casinos um, and entertainment. Um, and I'm really misspelling entertainment, but that's okay. I know what I mean. Um, and is an entertainer at heart. And so um, maybe this person isn't a performer themselves, but like owns the places that can have this. Because one of the things that I like to do with my NPCs is make them 
relatable in some way. This evil banker person is not relatable until we get to this entertainer at heart. Like maybe what this banker person does is like they have the casino and maybe they bring in traveling shows, uh, vaudeville acts. Uh, it's, I think it's, it might be too early for vaudeville, but at any rate, like traveling shows and um, really entertains the town. And that gives like a redeeming quality. Like this, this person does this um, from an actual pure wanting to make people laugh and be entertained uh, place. They're not trying to get people to laugh to like suck their souls out. It's because that's what they want to do. I like that idea. Now I see Chelsea has commented. Maybe he's trying to give the child the power of the divine guardian to give himself more leverage. Uh, and, uh, and on the stage coaches, ah, that is great. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to actually just copy that comment and post it right into here. So I think that's a great idea. Uh, I think that she's young enough and unformed as a kind of a, a person, a young spirit that can be, um, that can be modified that way. I like that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and grab all of these cards and that is the evil banker human. Okay. I want to do one more of these NPCs, uh, like this, and then I'm going to go on to kind of creating a little bit more of a, a fate specific sort of presentation for that. So, um, if you're in the chat and you have some, uh, uh um, uh, some opinions on what we should do next. Um, we've got the Peacock Cane as an entity. We have a Divine Guardian and we have Madame Charlotte. Uh, do we have any preferences for which one we should sort of uh, tackle next? I'm going to go ahead and move these cards out of out of the way here. So and actually try to return them to their correct stacks. Um, so I have them. Uh, I'm seeing no one with any strong opinions in the chat, which is perfectly okay, uh, because that just means that I get my choice, um, which I don't have a strong choice. So I am actually going to, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to roll a D4. Um, Madam Charlotte will be a one and a two. She's kind of central to what's going on. So I want to weigh that a little bit more heavily. Um, Divine Guardian will be three and Peacock Cane will be number four. Um, so one nice thing about Google um, is that um, you can roll uh, 1d4 and no, really, my internet is failing me. That's amazing. Well, at least I'm still streaming, right? So Google will turn up a result in just a moment and boom, it's number three. So that means we're going to work on the divine guardian now. So let's, um, let's go ahead. Uh, I do not want that shape for these ones, but I do want to change it for you. All right. So we've got the, the, um, the stagecoach divine guardians and Divine Guardian is a very generic term. So the question is, like, what do, like, you know, what, is, what does Divine Guardian mean for stagecoaches? You know, um, uh, so that's a, a great question. So let's, um, let's turn to Google again. Let's do, uh, let's see, uh, Divine Guardians Old West. Um all right, so the first one says Divine Guardians. Um, let's go ahead. Uh, sometimes I will just Google various topics and just be like, all right, what's going on? Um, let's see, Divine Guardians. Um, you know what? Actually, let's look up um, ranks of angels um, because the players have specifically um, asked, you know, for a very kind of, um, uh, Christian sort of, uh, play in the, in the game. So let's look at the different spheres that we have here. Um, Sephirum, 
Cheru I can't pronounce things sometimes. So then there are thrones, um, living symbols of justice and authority. That is interesting. And ties in the idea of thrones is interesting because like a stagecoach, like the people who, who like pilot those, like, I mean, they're sitting. So it's kind of like a mobile throne. Um, let's continue on. Let's look dominations or lordships. Um, you know what? Let me actually zoom in a little bit and turn off. Sorry, I didn't notice that that was overlapping. Um, second sphere, dominations or lordships. Uh, regulate the duties of lower angels. That could also be interesting because stagecoaches like um, kind of like old school UPS. So needing to like be organized would be pretty good. Okay. Oh, and here they may be distinguished from other groups by wielding orbs of light fastened to the heads of their scepters. Hmm. That might tie into our, our peacock cane. Um, virtues, powers or authorities, supervised movements of heavenly bodies, principalities, that guide and protect nations, groups of people, or institutions. I think this is perfect right here. Um, the principality in the third sphere. Um, so what this means is I'm going to take this and copy it. Let's go over here. We're going to paste that into this post-it note, um, which has very small text now, uh, but that's okay. Let's... Um, Grab the link to make sure that if we need it again, um, oh, nope, do that. Uh, if we need it again, it will be available to us. Now let's go ahead and read this. So principalities are shown wearing a crown and carrying a scepter. Um, uh, their duty is said to be to carry out orders given to them by the upper sphere of angels, bequeath blessings to the material world, oversee groups of people, educator and guardians to the realm of earth, um, like beings related to the world of, I'm not sure what that is, uh, to inspire living things to art or science. All right, cool. So this gives us a place to kind of start with our defined guardian, um, which is going to be a, uh, angel of the principalities or rulers, which is in the third sphere. Let me just copy that text. Oop. Wrong one. Uh, let's add it to the top here. All right, great. Um, so now let's do the um, the divine guardian that we have. Um, let's go ahead and draw some cards. I'm going to add the card back on here. Um, and honestly, I think that this is probably going to be the last bit of um, prep that I'm going to do is this guardian here. I know that I mentioned doing fleshing one of these out a little bit. Um, oh, thank you, Chelsea. A, a germinal idea is like the seed of a story. Thank you. Um, so I know I said that I was going to flesh these out into um, like one of them into uh, full like fate fader rise. Uh, not a real word, uh, them, but I'm kind of running out of steam because I've been talking for three hours straight now. So I think what I'll probably end up doing is we're going to finish the Divine Guardian because I think this is really cool and I got some ideas. But um, then I think um, I'm going to work on my notes uh, or then I think I'm going to... Um, stop the stream because I'm kind of running out of steam. Um, I definitely, definitely want to do this again because I think that this has been, um, this has been awesome for me because in order to answer the questions that you've had, I've had to think about what, uh, you know, about the questions. So it's been a learning experience for me. Let's finish the divine guardian. Um, so the divine guardian here, Oh, um, let's go ahead and, um, draw some cards. Oh, I'm going to, just take care of this real quick and let's draw some cards. So um, short order card number one is lucky and short order card number two is rude. Um, awesome. Let's see what secret does our 
uh, friend has knows a secret Ooh. and goals. The goal is going to be perfection. That kind of plays in pretty well, I think. All right. So let's um, let's see about uh, figuring out some of these things. So the first thing that we have is lucky. Oh, let's zoom out a little bit. So that is there. The next one is, what did we draw? We drew rude, which is awesome. I love rude angels. Um, let's see, then nose uh, secret. And then lastly, it is going to be perfection is a goal. Um, all right, so let's, oh, Let's go ahead and think about this. Oh, hey, Astrid says hi. You know what, Astrid? You can come in here and say hello to everybody on the stream. You have been very patient and very good. So you can come in here and say hello to everybody. So uh, so when Astrid uh, joins us, I, I will let her say hello. She has been dying to, to say hello to everybody. So, um, so let's see. We've got Lucky, Rude, No Secret, and Perfection, uh, which... It's pretty funny that I spelled perfection wrong there. Um, all right. So what can we do with um, lucky, rude, knows a secret, and perfection? So I think the question that I have is, oh, oh, Astrid is here. Come here, kiddo. All right. Hi. No, <laughs> right there's the camera. Hi. You want to tell anybody anything? No. Okay. She just wanted to say hello. Uh, all right. So the first question that I have is what form is the divine guardian going to take? Like, is it going to be like a person shaped divine guardian? Is it going to be like, uh, maybe one of the, maybe the horses that pull the stage coaches? Um, you know, what, you know, what form do we want the divine guardian to be? Um, I'm leaning towards it being a person, uh, just because that will make, um, that will make interactions a little bit easier, but I'm thinking maybe they can transform into a horse too. Um, I think that just might give it a little bit more of a divine feel a little bit. Um, so that that's something that's loose in my mind. That's not really anything. So let's talk about lucky. Um, so how is this divine guardian, this angel from the third sphere uh, from principalities, how are they lucky? Um, uh, you know, I think they're going to be lucky um, because uh, they are assigned to deal directly with people. I think that's what it's going to be. I think that this divine guardian is going to feel really lucky because they actually uh, get to interact with real people on earth. Like maybe like most angels don't get to actually do that, but this one um, has been assigned this particular duty and is lucky because they were uh, get to deal directly with people. And so there's a, a sense of like gratitude from this divine guardian um, that they get to do this. Um, so that, that I think sounds pretty good. Um, now the divine guardian is, um, rude. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that we can interpret rude. We can interpret rude as, you know, get away from me people, or we can interpret rude as like not understanding like social norms. So, um, I mean, one of the things that I'm thinking about is I'm thinking like Castiel from Supernatural, you know, Castiel, um, didn't quite have an understanding of what was going on in the world and it made it very interesting. Um, I think that I'm going to lean that direction with this because, um, as much as I like rude supernatural powers that are supposed to be on your side, um, I want to, I, I, one of the requests from the players was that this was kind of almost clear cut between good and evil. And so I don't want there to be like a, um, a cross between, um, Chelsea has commented. I'm imagining a newly promoted angel who's super excited to be here, but not very good at it yet. So it keeps making social missteps. That is perfectly in line with what, uh, I'm thinking. So I'm actually going to just copy what she wrote or what Chelsea wrote. I'm, I don't mean to um, presume pronouns. Um, 
so yes so this person or this uh divine guardian is going to be new um and is going to be rude because they don't understand social norms now um knows a secret um that's a good question. Let's le let that hang for a moment. Let's come down to perfection. So whenever it comes to perfection, um, let's read what the card says here to see what it kind of means. It says, the impossible dream is what you chase. In the areas of life that matter to you, you want to become the ideal, the measure against which all others are judged and found wanting. Uh, practice, dedication, and discipline are your daily routine and nothing has a higher priority. So... I think um, Chelsea is a they. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for um, pointing that out. Um, uh, I try to be as respectful as I can. Sometimes I forget, um, but, uh, you know, I am always trying my best. Um, so for perfection, um, I'm thinking that in this instance, not exactly what it had on the card, but um, trying to do the best job possible like so this this angel that's lucky to be dealing with people who doesn't understand societal norms is trying to do the best job possible and um maybe that's part of where kind of like this conflict comes in some conflict comes in is because the divine guardian is trying to do a perfect job um you know and dealing with humans maybe this merger is happening because the divine guardian believes that um it's going to help the divine guardian help more humans and um maybe it's not really going to so maybe this divine guardian doesn't have like is trying to do the best job possible but um because societal stuff um, or social stuff is outside of its norms it doesn't pick up on the fact that this is kind of like a merger and acquisition sort of situation that is not going to go well for the divine guardian um and that's where our team of, of heroes comes in to kind of help out with what's going on. I like where this is going. So let's talk about no secret. Um, with no secret, I'm going to kind of zoom back out a little bit and I want to take a look at what we've got on the board. Um, uh, because I want to find out if there's a good secret for the divine guardian to know that we pass along to the players because, um, NPCs having secrets um, only matter if the PCs find out those secrets, right? So, um, so let's take a look at. Um, uh, oh, you know what? I actually, I absolutely um, know what we can do, and it has nothing to do with what's going on here. So, this secret that is um, known um, here. Hold on. Here we go. Uh, so this known secret relates whoom, all the way over here to the deaths that happened with um, Peacocks, the mysterious death of uh, their parents, Moira, the mysterious death of her husband, the, the secret that this divine guardian knows um, relates to, to that. And so this no secret, um, is going to give a clue to the deaths, um, of those individuals. So what that's going to be is that's going to be a seed for a future, uh, session. Um, I'm not sure what that seed's going to be because I don't know exactly how they died. Um, and, and I don't need to determine exactly how they died. Um, oh, let me move this over. I'm so sorry. I, again, I, I didn't look and I saw I was obstructing some of this. Um, and so I think that what that can mean is like, maybe like when the divine guardian is, um, you know, uh, the, the heroes help, uh, the divine guardian. And at the end, the divine guardian can say, Hey, you know, um, uh, the divine guardian, uh, the divine guardian can say, Hey, I want you to know that your um, that the, the deaths that Moira and Peacock experienced, uh, are related. Um, and so what that does, like it could be literally as little as that, um, just to give them an idea of what's going on. And so if this game were to continue, um, that would almost kind of feed into the next story arc where it's like, okay, so maybe we, we feed into this as the next story arc. Um, and start to to tie that in together. 
Um, so that is our um, divine guardian there. Great. Um, any suggestions for the divine guardian? Anybody out there have anything that like any ideas that they'd like to contribute? Um, that it, I know I didn't ask a whole lot during this one is because I was kind of on a roll, but um, kind of brought this together. Um, I don't see any responses, so that is OK. So um, so let's see. Let's just move these NPC cards up here. We're going to change the shape to match the other ones. Um, and I will circle back around to those later. So um, so at this point, I think I'm going to bring this live stream to a conclusion uh, or, yeah, I'm going to bring it to an end um, because I I personally am running out of steam for talking for so long, but I hope that you got a lot of value out of this um, just to kind of uh, recap. What we did today is we went through and answered all of these questions in these different groups that everybody had um, answered, like, I think every single one of them. Um, uh, this this link, this board uh, is available uh, in uh, one of the Patreon posts. So you can always come back here and visit this um, and you can also come back. And because it's on the same board, you can come back and visit this as well to see what's going on. And, and as I uh, work on this, uh, this board may change as well. Um, so after we went through all of the questions that everyone had, um, we then uh, came over here and we took all of the aspects of the players and we, we, made them all on their own little cards and we started to gang them together in different groupings that we could relate that were going to prompt some story ideas. Once we had those story ideas, we then kind of uh, came down here and we started to uh, draw a bunch of squiggly lines between them. So we started to flesh out like, why is Madame Charlotte and Harrington, the con artist related? What are they going to do in this storyline? Uh, Madame Charlotte and the Peacock Cane and the Reverend and Moira. And so what we've done is, is we've tied everybody together here in bringing the story together. And then from that, we said, what NPCs do we need? We needed, we needed an evil banker. We needed Madam Charlotte because we haven't written her yet. We needed a divine guardian, um, down here to, to represent that. And then the peacock cane, um, we're going to do a little bit of work with, um, as well, even though that's probably going to be a super small part, uh, of, of this particular, um, session, uh, I still want to have this fleshed out because that will be something that will be in my back pocket uh, to be used later. Then we, um, with those four NPCs, um, we came and we started to uh, bring them together using the, the cards that I showed. Um, we created this uh, evil human banker. Uh, we created the divine guardian um, and just shared my process for how I bring uh, a lot of these things together. Uh, as I said before, I hope that you got a lot of value out of this. Um, if you did, uh, you know, great. I'm glad. Um, leave comments, ask questions. Um, I definitely want to do this again. Uh, I've been considering like maybe the, uh, I'll ask the weird West players if they'd like to do a few sessions and we can kind of go through that. Um, that's an idea that's been in the back of my head. Um, thank you all. Um, thank you for supporting the fate Patreon. I really appreciate it. Um, it brings me a lot of joy to get comments and likes, um, and know that I'm, I'm helping improve your game. So thank you all very much. And um, if I don't hear from you, have a wonderful holiday and uh, wonderful and safe holiday season. Thank you so much.